creatures that had unique features which allowed them to grow to incredible sizes. They were some of the most impressive animals to have ever existed on our planet. The Argentinosaurus is a genus of sauropod dinosaurs that lived approximately 94, 97 million years ago in what is now South America. Scientists think it was one of the largest land animals ever, with a length of up to 100 feet and a weight of up to 100 tons. A farmer stumbled upon a giant leg bone while tending his cattle. That's how he discovered the first fossils of the Argentinosaurus in Argentina in 1987. Further excavations uncovered more bones, revealing a massive dinosaur that would have dwarfed most other animals of its time. The Spinosaurus, meaning spine lizard, is a genus of theropod dinosaur that lived around 112, 97 million years ago in what is now North Africa. It is believed to be one of the largest carnivorous dinosaurs to ever exist, with a length of up to 60 feet and a weight of up to 23 tons. The Spinosaurus is known for its distinctive elongated sail-like structure on its back. It was likely used for thermoregulation. It also had long crocodile-like jaws that were lined with sharp teeth. This allowed the creature to catch and eat large prey, such as fish, crocodiles, and other dinosaurs. The first fossils of the Spinosaurus were discovered in Egypt in 1912. The sperm whale, Physeter macrocephalus, is a species of toothed whale that is the largest toothed predator on Earth. It also has the largest brain of any animal species. It is found in oceans all over the world and can dive to depths of up to 7,000 feet in search of food. You can easily recognize sperm whales by their massive, block-shaped heads, which can measure up to one-third of their total body length. They have dark brown or grayish-blue skin and a distinctive wrinkled appearance. The Titanoboa is an extinct genus of a giant snake that lived approximately 60, 58 million years ago. It is considered to be the largest known snake ever. It could grow up to 42 feet and weighed around 2,500 pounds. The first fossils of the Titanoboa were discovered in a coal mine in Colombia in 2004. This discovery meant a lot because it provided insights into the size and behavior of snakes during the Paleocene era, as well as the overall climate and ecosystem of the time. The blue whale, Balanoptera musculus, is the largest animal on Earth, measuring up to 100 feet in length and weighing as much as 200 tons. These marine mammals are found in oceans all over the world and can live up to 90 years. Blue whales have a long, streamlined body that is usually blue-gray in color with mottled patterns. They have a small dorsal fin and two pectoral fins that are about one-third the length of their body. Blue whales feed on tiny shrimp-like creatures called krill, and they eat a lot. A single adult blue whale can eat up to 8,000 pounds of krill in a day. The Leedsichthus is an extinct genus of large, bony fish that lived during the Jurassic period approximately 165, 155 million years ago. It is believed to be one of the largest fish that have ever lived. Some estimates suggest that it could grow up to 50, 55 feet in length. The first fossils of Leedsichthus were discovered in England in the 19th century, and more recent discoveries have been made in other parts of Europe, South America, and Africa. Despite its enormous size, the Leedsichthus was a filter feeder, similar to modern-day whale sharks, and likely fed on plankton and other small organisms. The creature did it by simply swimming with its enormous mouth open, filtering water through its gills. The Pterodostro is an extinct species of flamingo-like birds that lived approximately 70, 35 million years ago. They were relatively small birds with a wingspan of about two, three feet and they were known for their distinctive long, narrow beaks equipped with comb-like structures used for filter feeding. The pterodostro lived in shallow bodies of water, like lakes and lagoons, and mostly fed on small crustaceans and other tiny organisms. The animal filtered them from the water using the comb-like structures on the inside of its beak while swimming through the water. The African elephant is the largest land animal on Earth and one of the most recognizable ones. There are two species of the African elephant, the savanna elephant, Loxodonta africana, and the forest elephant, Loxodonta cyclotus. You can see them in various parts of sub-Saharan Africa. These creatures can be identified by their large size, gray skin, and long trunks. African elephants can grow up to 13 feet tall 
and weigh up to 7,000, 14,000 pounds, depending on the species and gender. How heavy is the largest living snake? How can a snake eat a whale? Get ready, I'm about to answer these questions. Before the last ice age, giant mammals like mammoths ruled the world. The modern animal kingdom we're familiar with was shaped around 55 million years ago. I mean, there were still 1,000 pound bear dogs living from Asia to America. But modern whales, for instance, began to appear later. I'm saying modern whales because, surprise, surprise, whales weren't always fully aquatic. The ancestors of the ocean's biggest animals once walked on dry land. They had four legs and lived on the coast. Now, I want to introduce you to a snake that used to eat these whales, the Palaeophys, a genus of a marine snake. Scientists say it's hard to understand how big the Palaeophys was due to its fragmentary fossil record. They assume that it could have reached up to 40 feet long. Its fossils were found in different parts of the world, from England to Morocco and Virginia, USA. The Phileophys is extinct now, and sea snakes today are only about a quarter of the size this majestic creature used to be. So no need to worry about this underwater monster. But there once was an even bigger snake, the Titan Boa. It was around 50 feet long and most likely weighed over a ton. It used to live in what is now known as northeastern Colombia around 60 to 58 million years ago. Scientists say that it mostly fed on fish. Another giant animal that lived in the past was the black Gigantopithecus. These primates aren't related to gorillas. They lived in the area of modern China. Some people believe that they're still alive, but so far, no one has laid eyes on them. Some people even go further and say that the stories of Bigfoot or Yeti are based on these animals. This rodent became extinct about 2 million years ago. Its main habitat was South America, more specifically, Uruguay. What's astonishing about this species is that it was the largest rodent ever known. It was bigger than a bull. Scientists believe that it weighed up to 1,000 pounds. A distant relative of this rodent is still alive today. It's called the Pacarana. It's a rare animal that lives in South America. It weighs up to 33 pounds and measures up to 31 inches, not including its cute and fluffy tail. The Arthropleura was an insect that lived in prehistoric times. Imagine a giant millipede measuring up to 8 feet in length. Here you go. It was one of the largest land animals of its era, about 315 million years ago. The Arthropleura's shell was covered with tough plates. These plates were there to protect the creature from damage. Most of the time, it burrowed into the ground to avoid becoming some other animal's dinner. Meet the Megalodon. Millions of years ago, this shark lived in the ocean and ate other marine creatures. It had wide teeth and its jaws were so powerful that the animal could finish off its prey with the force of its bite. It was one of the largest sharks to ever exist. Yet, this predator also went extinct. Scientists don't really know the reason. This made me wonder why animals were so big in the past. Nowadays, smaller creatures flee or hide from predators. But apparently, it wasn't like this before. Many centuries ago, animals didn't just run or hide, they fought back. Research suggests that this behavior may have been the most important motivation for prey to grow bigger. A study compared the skulls of ancient animals to those of their modern peers. The skulls of predatory animals have become shorter and narrower, while the skulls of the animals they hunted have become longer and broader. This means that predators learned to become experts in hunting, while prey worked on developing their defense skills. You see, a larger body size was a great advantage because it made it harder for predators to take down the animals they hunted. The bottom line? Self-defense made prehistoric animals larger. The second reason why ancient animals were larger is related to their bones. They had hollow bones, which are lighter than solid bones. This type of bone allowed large animals to move quickly. Let's take sauropods.
they were a dinosaur subgroup. Sauropods had giraffe-like long necks and snake-like long tails. Compared to their body size, their head was really tiny. But since their bones were quite light, they could move around without having to carry additional weight. The eating habits of these animals were also related to their body size. When experts examined the fossils of one extinct mammal species, they found out that these animals had a diet that was high in nutrients and low in fiber. And this mammal was the largest land animal of its period. In other words, following this diet, mammals could grow to be very large. There was plenty of food out there, so they didn't have to worry about finding it. Fun fact, these animals also took chewing out of the picture. They could swallow their food in large pieces instead of taking small bites. Environmental conditions also played an important role in the evolution of larger animals in prehistoric times. Those animals tended to live in warm, moist climates that provided them with a lot of food. They didn't have to compete for food sources. Researchers believe that because of these conditions, natural selection worked in a certain way. I mean, body size was more important than such traits as agility and speed. Oh, and did you know that large animals tend to produce more carbon dioxide? And ultimately, a bigger volume of carbon dioxide increases the amount of vegetation in the animal's habitat. As for the abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere at that time, it could be another vital element for some animal's growth. A good but scary example of an animal that benefited from the high levels of oxygen can be the cockroach of the Paleozoic era. At that time, cockroaches were the size of modern house cats. Now this one would give me the chills if I ever faced it. Ugh. What about today? Well, there are over 3,000 species of snakes on Earth. The smallest snake in the world is the Barbados thread snake. It's only around 4 inches long when fully grown. And the largest one? It's the reticulated python. This snake reaches around 20 feet in length. The longest python was discovered in 1912. It measured 32 feet long. As for the largest and heaviest reticulated python, it was named Medusa. Medusa was approximately 25 feet long and weighed 350 pounds. These reptiles lived in Southeast Asia in rainforests, woodlands, and grasslands. Don't be confused though, the reticulated python isn't the heaviest snake in the world. This title belongs to the green anaconda. It weighs approximately 500 pounds. Green anacondas are found in South America and Trinidad in damp, humid areas. I have a bonus for you. Here is a flying snake. You can find these snakes in Southeast Asia. They don't fly like birds, of course, but they do use the power of flight. They can go as high as 300 feet. They leap from tree branches into the air. Once they take off, it's all about aerodynamics. Their main technique is flaring their ribs and pulling in their abdomens. While airborne, they undulate from one side to another and slightly up and down. This motion helps snakes to turn and glide. Why bother with all this if they can just crawl in an old school way? Scientists aren't sure, but they believe it might be related to escaping from predators. This way, they move from one tree to another without having to get down to the ground. Every now and then, people discover fossils of animals that lived millions of years ago. These ancient discoveries continue to capture our imagination. Which of these animals would you like to see alive? Now, if Earth's history were a movie, we humans would only take up the last second of the end credits. Our planet has been around for about 4.6 billion years, but our human story began about 300,000 years ago, in Africa. Now our ancestors had some wild adventures in nature. They could have run into creatures so big, they'd make today's elephants look like puppies. The woolly mammoth is a pretty famous animal, sure. His cousin, though, the Colombian mammoth, not so much. This giant used to roam places from Canada all the way down to Mexico. Unlike the furrier woolly mammoths, which hung out in colder places, these animals had shorter hair, resembling huge elephants. They also had incredibly large tusks, like 12 feet worth of spiraling sturdy tusks. 
And they weren't just for show, they came in handy when facing predators. That includes our ancestors. If you think about sloths these days, you're picturing these adorably slow creatures. They couldn't possibly be in your list of most dangerous animals. Well, their grandparents might have. For starters, we call them ground sloths, and they vary a lot in size. Some were as big as rhinos, and others, like the megatherium, were as colossal as elephants. Imagine seeing a 20-foot-long sloth which doesn't mind chewing on some meat every now and then. At least in theory. Ever heard of Bigfoot? Well, our next animal kind of looks like him, but is a distant cousin to orangutans. Meet Gigantopithecus, the largest primate to ever call our planet its home. Standing tall at 10 feet and weighing more than 600 pounds, these animals were amazing to look at in real life. Unlike Bigfoot, they weren't constantly hiding. In fact, it's believed they were peaceful and gentle creatures. Sadly, they faded away about 100,000 years ago, mainly because their food sources slowly became unavailable. Those lush, fruity forests they called home eventually turned into dry grasslands. Next on our list is the cave hyena. Weighing a chunky 250 pounds and standing 3 feet tall, these beasts were as long as a grown-up lying down. What's even more interesting about these creatures is that they love hanging out in groups. A pack could be as big as 30 of these animals, which meant they could easily take on even the biggest, heaviest mastodons. Our ancient families would have needed to stay alert around these hungry specimens. Sadly, for these hyenas about 20,000 years ago, their numbers started going down. Soon enough, they completely disappeared from the planet. Quick pop quiz. Which called a tiger but isn't really one? It's the saber-toothed tiger. I mean, sure, they belong to the feline family, but they aren't technically tigers. First appearing around 42 million years ago, in July, I think, many of their kind were gone before we even showed up. However, early Americans might have bumped into a couple of specimens from this group. If that really happened, it would have been quite the encounter. Think of the biggest wild lion today or the hefty Siberian tiger. These big cats also had some incredible features hidden in their fur. They were good at sneaking around, hiding, and pouncing on mammoths bigger than themselves. Their bite wasn't that strong, but they could open their jaws wide, like twice as much as a lion. And although their teeth were a bit on the weak side, they had buff forearms to pin down their dinner, giving those big fangs a purpose. Not the kind of kitty you'd want to play with. Dire wolves made their debut about 250,000 years ago. They were like the gray wolves we know today, but a lot stronger. While wolves these days stretch out to about 6 feet and tip the scales at 170 pounds max, dire wolves were about 5 feet and about 150 pounds. Found all over North and South America, they had admirable jaws, biting nearly a third harder than their modern counterparts. Also, their favorite snack was horses. But just like many other majestic beasts of the past, they faded away around 10,000 years ago. Now, names can be deceiving. Take the American lion, for example. It's not really a lion, it's more of a panther's big cousin. The other part of the name is correct, though. They did live in America about 330,000 years ago. This feline was no lap cat either. They were at the top of the wildcat pyramid, weighing a colossal 772 pounds. That's like stacking four grown men on a scale. Even the mighty African lion would look a tad bit shy beside these beasts. With the muscle to take down a bison, you wouldn't want to accidentally interrupt their dinner. They parted ways with this planet around 11,000 years ago, right after the last ice age. Now, down in Australia, about 50,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, there lurked a relative of the Komodo dragon, the Megalania. Experts love to have debates on how big it was. Some say it stretched out to 23 feet. Others think it was just about 11 feet long. Either way, they were basically mega-sized Komodo dragons with a dangerous bite. If you think bears are already big and fluffy now, let's introduce the short-faced bear. While this big creature stood on its hind legs, it towered at 14 feet. With long limbs, they could outrun today's bears, 
hitting speeds up to 40 miles per hour. These ultra bears sadly disappeared around 11,600 years ago. Now imagine a crocodile. Okay, imagine that same crocodile, only supersized, with sporty legs doing its thing in Australia about 1.6 million years ago. Well, say hello to the Quincana. These crocs were extremely large, reaching 23 feet. And no, they weren't lazy river loungers. These creatures really love spending time on land. They evolved to have strong legs for their chases and razor-sharp teeth designed for slicing, not gripping. When did we stop sharing beaches with them? About 40,000 years ago. The name elephant bird might not sound familiar, but try to picture a bird that stood tall as high as a basketball hoop at 10 feet and weighed as much as a small car, 1,500 pounds. Their eggs were equally huge, like 150 chicken eggs bundled up into one. Now, as amazing as these birds sound, there's a lot we still don't know about them. They're hard to study, as most extinct animals are. Still, some recent studies have given us some clues. Scientists have been examining ancient molecules from their fossilized eggshells. It's an awesome piece of evidence, since these birdie shells were thick, preserving precious DNA inside. Plus, there are tons of these eggshell fragments sprinkled all over Madagascar's beaches. Because of these findings, we now know these birds were herbivores and loved eating leaves and seeds. We also know the tiny kiwi bird is its closest living relative. Now, dodos were these amazing birds we also used to share the planet with. They're like distant cousins to Asian pigeons. To give you some perspective, imagine a chunky bird weighing about 50 pounds. Similar to chickens, turkeys, and ostriches, dodos were also the types of birds that couldn't fly. Their wings were small, and they had the muscle strength of, well, a wet noodle. Now, you might have heard the word dodo used as a name for creatures that aren't that bright. Don't get confused, though, by this name. These birds were, in fact, intelligent. Scientists were able to figure that out by studying their fossils. It turns out that they were good at smelling stuff, unlike most birds that are all about the visuals. These creatures aren't around for us to study anymore, but that might change. One evolutionary biologist is on a mission to fully understand these amazing ancient birds. On that note, she revealed that the dodo's DNA has been completely sequenced. There are even talks about potentially bringing dodos back to life. They would make a nice addition to the lovely beaches of Mauritius, the place they used to call home many, many years ago. Researchers have been waiting for this find for a long time. They came in all shapes and sizes. It would have been hard to distinguish them from dinosaurs. Most species weren't bigger than a mouse. It's like a reminder of a long-gone era when its ancestors walked on all fours. The first mammals to walk the Earth were different from us humans in one important aspect. We walk on two legs. That makes us bipedal. But the first animals that made the transition from sea to land were tetrapods. This means they walked on four legs. The story of these creatures began in present-day Scotland. The region is home to the first terrestrial ecosystem in the world. The rock here is made from silica. This material is the building block of glass. Hot volcanic springs formed these rocks more than 400 million years ago. Such land composition is a treasure trove for paleontologists. These are the scientists who study the fossil remains of animals and plants. In Scotland, they found everything from plants with preserved cells to the oldest known fossils of insects. They even discovered a fungus that grew up to 29 feet tall. But there was one find that stood out from all the other ones. In 2015, scientists unearthed fossils of four-legged animals. The place of discovery was Willie's Hole, near the hillside village of Chernside in the south of the country. Researchers dated the finds to the Paleozoic era, about 360 million years ago. This was the time when the early ancestors of the dinosaurs thrived. The world was a much different place back then. Today, we associate Scotland with cold and rain, and kilts and golf. But at that time, this land sat closer to the equator. It had lush vegetation, and its climate was hot and humid. 
droughts and flooding were quite common. It was the perfect setting for an important evolutionary event. Researchers have been waiting for this find for a long time. The fossil records had a 15 million year gap. Its name was Romer's Gap, after the Harvard professor who described it. Science was missing fossil evidence of the animals that ventured onto land on all fours. The five fossil species they found in Scotland shed light on this mystery. The first tetrapods were divided into two large groups. One of them contained the ancestors of birds, reptiles, and mammals. Their collective name is Amniotis. The other included the ancestors of amphibians, such as frogs. When these and similar species migrated to dry land, they discovered that they weren't alone. The earliest life forms that made this evolutionary leap were liverwort-like plants. We know this because scientists found their spores. They also discovered fossilized remains of an air-breathing millipede. It had tiny holes that allowed it to breathe air. This puts it among the first oxygen-breathing animals on the planet. And this species of millipedes is the first land dweller in the animal kingdom. Today, the largest of such creatures is the African elephant. Scientists believe that one of the first four-legged creatures to make it onto land was an amphibian ancestor. Its name was Istiostega. The first part of the animal's name translates from ancient Greek as fish. This reveals a lot about the way the creature moved. It dragged itself on the ground using only its front limbs that resembled fins. This is the way that mudskipper fish move on land today. This isn't how we imagine proper walking. But during the period our hero lived on Earth, it was the perfect way to get around. The climate had both extremely dry and wet periods. The ability to walk and swim at the same time was especially useful. The fossils from Scotland supported this claim. The fish-like animals scientists found had four slender limbs. This is the perfect equipment for life on land, not inside the ocean. There was further evidence. The fossils displayed well-developed lungs for breathing outside of water. But their legs were still too weak to completely lift the body off the ground. The tail section had to slither along the surface, similar to how a snake moves forward. This animal that resembled a modern-day salamander lived during the Paleozoic era. This was the time when four-legged creatures developed a standard number of digits at the end of their hands and feet, five on each. We know them today as fingers. All species that had more than five fingers started slowly disappearing. These pteropods split into two groups. The first of them had to return to the sea to lay eggs. This group would later give rise to amphibians. The second kind of tetrapods is more interesting to human evolution. They're considered the ancestors of reptiles, dinosaurs, and mammals. The Permian period came at the end of the Paleozoic. By this time, all life forms on Earth inhabited the supercontinent of Pangaea. There were vast deserts far away from the oceans. The more important species that walked on all fours during this time were the synapsids. They came in all shapes and sizes. But the only subgroup of synapsids to survive into the Cenozoic were the mammals. Doesn't seem like much, but we exist today thanks to these ancient tetrapods. As a species, we have come far in the tree of life. A recent study revealed that the first life form to evolve was an ocean-drifting comb jelly. This came as a bit of a surprise. For a long time, researchers believed that the simple sponge was the oldest animal on the planet. After analyzing vast amounts of data, comb jelly came on top. Or the bottom, depending on how you look at the tree of life. These ancient beings were squishy and had tentacles, but they weren't the true jellyfish like the ones we see today. The creatures lacked the bell-shaped body and stinging cells. Scientists cannot precisely date the species because they lack a fossil of the oldest comb jelly. This is not the case with other ancient creatures that once roamed our planet. The ancestor of dinosaurs, turtles, and crocodiles are familiar to science. These are the animals that appeared during the Paleozoic era. This was a time when true tetrapods appeared. Paleontologists recognized them by two distinctive openings on each side of their skull. The first mammals that appeared during this era resembled reptiles. It would have been hard to distinguish them from dinosaurs. Some of them later evolved features we all know today. These include fur and a warm-blooded metabolism. 
they developed during the time when dinosaurs dominated Earth. That's why these first true mammals were small. Most species weren't bigger than a mouse. Their diet consisted of plants, as they were herbivores. Also, they were creatures of the night. During the day, they were mostly hiding underground. Now this wasn't such a bad strategy. Some 66 million years ago, an asteroid fell on the Yucatan Peninsula in today's Mexico. And this spelled the end for dinosaurs. 75% of all species that lived on Earth at the time disappeared. The mammal's small size helped them survive and repopulate the planet. The era in the history of our planet that followed the Mesozoic was nicknamed the Age of the Mammals. The climate became warmer, so grasslands expanded. These were the ideal conditions for tetrapods to grow in size. Some mammals decided not to take this evolutionary path. Bats remained relatively small in size and took to the skies to join birds. And there are some tetrapods that return to the ocean. The most notable example are whales. Today, their closest living relatives are hippos. Both species are aquatic, but they develop this trait separately. The first whales were actually tetrapods. These were the most typical examples of four-legged land animals. If you saw them today, you would think they were oversized rats. That's what whales looked like some 50 million years ago. Paleontologists came to this conclusion in the 1980s by studying the skull of a now extinct animal. It lived around the edge of a large, shallow ocean. At some point in history, it returned to the marine way of life. Its back legs devolve. But sometimes, biologists stumble upon a living specimen of a whale that still displays tiny hind limbs in its skeleton. It's like a reminder of a long-gone era when its ancestors walked on all fours. Alrighty, folks. Gather around and let me tell you about the Mananangal, a real charmer of a mythical creature from Filipino folklore. She's often described as a lady who likes to snack on sleeping pregnant women. But here's the twist. During the day, she's all dolled up and looking like a total babe. But come nightfall, she detaches her torso and spreads her massive bat-like wings to fly off into the darkness in search of her next victim. And she doesn't just stop at pregnant ladies. Nope. Sometimes she'll use her good looks to lead astray men and take them to her secret hiding spot where she'll feast on their heart, intestines, and other internal organs all night long. Yikes. If you're ever faced with a Mananangal and want to stop her from reattaching her body before sunrise, just sprinkle some salt, ash, or crushed garlic on the remaining half of her body. Easy peasy, right? So keep an eye out for this winged wonder and don't forget the garlic! Okay, so check this out. In German folklore, there's this crazy creature called an Alp. Basically, it's like a vampire, mixed with an incubus. And it wears this dope hat called a tarn cap that gives it all kinds of powers. This dude is all about preying on women at night by messing with their dreams. Oh, and it's into breast milk and sucking the blood of men and kids. The Alp can shapeshift into all kinds of stuff, like cats, pigs, dogs, snakes, and even butterflies. And it's got this evil eye that can totally mess you up with bad luck or sickness. But don't worry, you can protect yourself by hiding a broomstick under your pillow, pointing your shoes towards the door, hanging iron horseshoes from the bedpost, or putting a mirror on your chest. And if all else fails, just leave the lights on all night and shove a lemon in its mouth if you catch it napping during the day. Meet the Pontia Nuk, a spooky ghost from Malay mythology. Legend has it that she was a woman who passed away while giving birth, and now she's out for revenge. She's not your average ghost either. She's got long black hair, sharp fingernails, and a blood-smeared white dress. But watch out, because she's also a master of disguise. She can transform into a beautiful woman to lure in her prey before ripping out their insides. If you're ever out at night and hear the cries of babies or feminine laughter, beware. That could be the Pontiana coming to get you. And if the sounds are quiet, she might be right around the corner. So keep your wits about you, and don't fall for any too-good-to-be-true ladies. Hey, did you know that according to Irish legend, every family has their very own banshee? This banshee lady is supposed to let out a piercing wail or shout when someone in the family is about to kick the bucket. Talk about a not-so-subtle warning. 
but don't let her eerie cry trick you. This banshee lady is said to be drop-dead gorgeous with long flowing locks and crimson eyes from all her crying. She's also known for wearing a gray shawl over her green threads. Fashionable and spooky? We're into it. Some people even say that this banshee can transform into a sweet singing young lady who foretells the doom of the family. Yikes. And if that's not enough to give you goosebumps, she's also been spotted hunched over in the woods, crying her eyes out at night. Sounds like a real party animal, doesn't she? So next time you hear a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the night, just remember, it might just be your friendly neighborhood banshee giving you a heads up. Now let me tell you about the Kalu Pillowit. These creatures are like the boogeyman of the Arctic. They live near the ice flows and are known for snatching up kids who get too close to the water. But don't worry, it's just a myth to keep children safe. Now, the appearance of these critters varies from story to story, but they all have some things in common. They've got slimy green skin, long hair, and long fingernails. Their hands are webbed like a fish, and they wear these fancy parkas made out of eider duck feathers. Oh, and watch out for their flippers. One of them can emit a sound that'll paralyze you. But don't fret, you can outsmart them. Some clever Inuit hunters figured out that if they asked the Kalu Piluit to shapeshift into a seal or whale, they could easily finish it and bring home a tasty catch. Yum! Some stories say that these creatures use kidnapped children to keep their hair looking fabulous. Talk about dedication to hair care. Others say that the kids are just devoured or used to fuel the Kalapiluit's youth. But here's a wild tale for you. There was once a grandma who couldn't feed her grandson, so she called upon a Kalapiluit to take him away. The tribe eventually got back on their feet, and a young couple went to rescue the boy. They found him tethered to seaweed by the Kalapiluit. But every time they got close, she'd drag him back underwater. They ended up waiting until sunrise to cut him loose. Yeah, the Kalupiluit may be spooky, but they're just looking out for the kiddos. And who knows, maybe they'll give you some hair care tips if you're lucky enough to meet one. Let me present to you the scariest horse-like monster in all of Scotland, the Nuklavi, or Nuklavi. This bad boy has a skinless body, a head ten times bigger than a human's, and a breath so poisonous it can destroy animals and crops. So, it's got wicked powers that can cause chaos all over the islands. But fear not, because there is an old spirit known as the Sea Mither who can control this terrifying beast during the summer months. The Nukalavi has roots in Norse and Orcadian folklore, and was first documented by the mysterious Joe Ben using some fancy Latin manuscripts back in the 16th century. Ernest Marwick, an Orcadian writer and folklorist, thinks that this evil sea creature is similar to the Norwegian Nok, the Nuggle of the Shetland, and the shape-shifting Kelpie, or Water Kelpie. So, if you're ever out and about in Scotland and come across this scary guy, just remember, call on the Sea Mither and run for your life. This dude is South African Tokolosha. It may look like a gremlin, but trust me, it's way more mischievous. Apparently, witches and shamans can summon them with their magical powers, but there are ways to keep these troublemakers in check. One way is to give them some curdled milk. Apparently, it's their favorite and trim their hair so they can see. If that doesn't work, you can call in a witch doctor to use some good old-fashioned magic to exercise them away. Now, according to South African folklore, these tokoloshes are mostly invisible and can suck on a stone to stay that way. So, if you want to keep them away from your home, scatter some special blessed salts, aka tokolosha salts, along your door frames and windowsills. Or if you're feeling extra cautious, Put some bricks under your bed's legs. Better safe than sorry, right? Have you heard of the Chimera? She's a total monster, literally. This fire-breathing female hybrid is made up of all sorts of animal parts. Think lion-like body, goat-like head, and a tail that ends in a snake's head. According to Greek mythology, the Chimera is the child of Typhon and Echidna, and her sisters are Cerberus and Lernaean Hydra. Sounds like a family reunion, huh? But don't worry, our hero Bellerophon was up for the challenge. The King of Lycia sent him on a mission to defeat the fearsome Chimera. And Bellerophon was the greatest hero monsters were scared of. The Chimera was no match for Bellerophon and his trusty Pegasus. Even though the King was secretly hoping the Chimera would take out Bellerophon instead, in the end, 
justice prevailed, and the Chimera was defeated. Well, that's it for today. How heavy is the largest living snake? How can a snake eat a whale? Get ready, I'm about to answer these questions. Before the last ice age, giant mammals like mammoths ruled the world. The modern animal kingdom we're familiar with was shaped around 55 million years ago. I mean, there were still 1,000 pound bear dogs living from Asia to America. But modern whales, for instance, began to appear later. I'm saying modern whales because, surprise, surprise, whales weren't always fully aquatic. The ancestors of the ocean's biggest animals once walked on dry land. They had four legs and lived on the coast. Now, I want to introduce you to a snake that used to eat these whales, the Palaeophys, a genus of a marine snake. Scientists say it's hard to understand how big the Palaeophys was due to its fragmentary fossil record. They assume that it could have reached up to 40 feet long. Its fossils were found in different parts of the world, from England to Morocco and Virginia, USA. The Phileophys is extinct now, and sea snakes today are only about a quarter of the size this majestic creature used to be. So no need to worry about this underwater monster. But there once was an even bigger snake, the Titan Boa. It was around 50 feet long and most likely weighed over a ton. It used to live in what is now known as Northeastern Colombia around 60 to 58 million years ago. Scientists say that it mostly fed on fish. Another giant animal that lived in the past was the black Gigantopithecus. These primates aren't related to gorillas. They lived in the area of modern China. Some people believe that they're still alive but so far, no one has laid eyes on them. Some people even go further and say that the stories of Bigfoot or Yeti are based on these animals. This rodent became extinct about two million years ago. Its main habitat was South America, more specifically, Uruguay. What's astonishing about this species is that it was the largest rodent ever known. It was bigger than a bull. Scientists believe that it weighed up to 1,000 pounds. A distant relative of this rodent is still alive today. It's called the Pacarana. It's a rare animal that lives in South America. It weighs up to 33 pounds and measures up to 31 inches, not including its cute and fluffy tail. The Arthropleura was an insect that lived in prehistoric times. Imagine a giant millipede measuring up to 8 feet in length. Here you go. It was one of the largest land animals of its era, about 315 million years ago. The Arthropleura's shell was covered with tough plates. These plates were there to protect the creature from damage. Most of the time, it burrowed into the ground to avoid becoming some other animal's dinner. Meet the Megalodon. Millions of years ago, this shark lived in the ocean and ate other marine creatures. It had wide teeth and its jaws were so powerful that the animal could finish off its prey with the force of its bite. It was one of the largest sharks to ever exist. Yet, this predator also went extinct. Scientists don't really know the reason. This made me wonder why animals were so big in the past. Nowadays, smaller creatures flee or hide from predators. But apparently, it wasn't like this before. Many centuries ago, animals didn't just run or hide, they fought back. Research suggests that this behavior may have been the most important motivation for prey to grow bigger. A study compared the skulls of ancient animals to those of their modern peers. The skulls of predatory animals have become shorter and narrower, while the skulls of the animals they hunted have become longer and broader. This means that predators learned to become experts in hunting, while prey worked on developing their defense skills. You see, a larger body size was a great advantage because it made it harder for predators to take down the animals they hunted. The bottom line? Self-defense made prehistoric animals larger. The second reason why ancient animals were larger is related to their bones. They had hollow bones, which are lighter than solid bones. This type of bone allowed large animals to move quickly. 
Let's take sauropods. They were a dinosaur subgroup. Sauropods had giraffe-like long necks and snake-like long tails. Compared to their body size, their head was really tiny. But since their bones were quite light, they could move around without having to carry additional weight. The eating habits of these animals were also related to their body size. When experts examined the fossils of one extinct mammal species, they found out that these animals had a diet that was high in nutrients and low in fiber. And this mammal was the largest land animal of its period. In other words, following this diet, mammals could grow to be very large. There was plenty of food out there, so they didn't have to worry about finding it. Fun fact, these animals also took chewing out of the picture. They could swallow their food in large pieces instead of taking small bites. Environmental conditions also played an important role in the evolution of larger animals in prehistoric times. Those animals tended to live in warm, moist climates that provided them with a lot of food. They didn't have to compete for food sources. Researchers believe that because of these conditions, natural selection worked in a certain way. I mean, body size was more important than such traits as agility and speed. Oh, and did you know that large animals tend to produce more carbon dioxide? And ultimately, a bigger volume of carbon dioxide increases the amount of vegetation in the animal's habitat. As for the abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere at that time, it could be another vital element for some animal's growth. A good but scary example of an animal that benefited from the high levels of oxygen can be the cockroach of the Paleozoic era. At that time, cockroaches were the size of modern house cats. Now this one would give me the chills if I ever faced it. Ugh. What about today? Well, there are over 3,000 species of snakes on Earth. The smallest snake in the world is the Barbados thread snake. It's only around 4 inches long when fully grown. And the largest one? It's the reticulated python. This snake reaches around 20 feet in length. The longest python was discovered in 1912. It measured 32 feet long. As for the largest and heaviest reticulated python, it was named Medusa. Medusa was approximately 25 feet long and weighed 350 pounds. These reptiles lived in Southeast Asia in rainforests, woodlands, and grasslands. Don't be confused though, the reticulated python isn't the heaviest snake in the world. This title belongs to the green anaconda. It weighs approximately 500 pounds. Green anacondas are found in South America and Trinidad in damp, humid areas. I have a bonus for you. Here is a flying snake. You can find these snakes in Southeast Asia. They don't fly like birds, of course, but they do use the power of flight. They can go as high as 300 feet. They leap from tree branches into the air. Once they take off, it's all about aerodynamics. Their main technique is flaring their ribs and pulling in their abdomens. While airborne, they undulate from one side to another and slightly up and down. This motion helps snakes to turn and glide. Why bother with all this if they can just crawl in an old school way? Scientists aren't sure, but they believe it might be related to escaping from predators. This way, they move from one tree to another without having to get down to the ground. Every now and then, people discover fossils of animals that lived millions of years ago. These ancient discoveries continue to capture our imagination. Which of these animals would you like to see alive? Now, if Earth's history were a movie, we humans would only take up the last second of the end credits. Our planet has been around for about 4.6 billion years, but our human story began about 300,000 years ago, in Africa. Now our ancestors had some wild adventures in nature. They could have run into creatures so big, they'd make today's elephants look like puppies. The woolly mammoth is a pretty famous animal, sure. His cousin, though, the Colombian mammoth, not so much. This giant used to roam places from Canada all the way down to Mexico. Unlike the furrier woolly mammoths, which hung out in colder places, these animals had shorter hair, resembling huge elephants. 
They also had incredibly large tusks, like 12 feet worth of spiraling sturdy tusks. And they weren't just for show, they came in handy when facing predators. That includes our ancestors. If you think about sloths these days, you're picturing these adorably slow creatures. They couldn't possibly be in your list of most dangerous animals. Well, their grandparents might have. For starters, we call them ground sloths, and they vary a lot in size. Some were as big as rhinos, and others, like the megatherium, were as colossal as elephants. Imagine seeing a 20-foot-long sloth which doesn't mind chewing on some meat every now and then. At least in theory. Ever heard of Bigfoot? Well, our next animal kind of looks like him, but is a distant cousin to orangutans. Meet Gigantopithecus, the largest primate to ever call our planet its home. Standing tall at 10 feet and weighing more than 600 pounds, these animals were amazing to look at in real life. Unlike Bigfoot, they weren't constantly hiding. In fact, it's believed they were peaceful and gentle creatures. Sadly, they faded away about 100,000 years ago, mainly because their food sources slowly became unavailable. Those lush, fruity forests they called home eventually turned into dry grasslands. Next on our list is the cave hyena. Weighing a chunky 250 pounds and standing 3 feet tall, these beasts were as long as a grown-up lying down. What's even more interesting about these creatures is that they loved hanging out in groups. A pack could be as big as 30 of these animals, which meant they could easily take on even the biggest, heaviest mastodons. Our ancient families would have needed to stay alert around these hungry specimens. Sadly, for these hyenas about 20,000 years ago, their numbers started going down. Soon enough, they completely disappeared from the planet. Quick pop quiz. What's called a tiger but isn't really one? It's the saber-toothed tiger. I mean, sure, they belong to the feline family, but they aren't technically tigers. First appearing around 42 million years ago, in July, I think, many of their kind were gone before we even showed up. However, early Americans might have bumped into a couple of specimens from this group. If that really happened, it would have been quite the encounter. Think of the biggest wild lion today or the hefty Siberian tiger. These big cats also had some incredible features hidden in their fur. They were good at sneaking around, hiding, and pouncing on mammoths bigger than themselves. Their bite wasn't that strong, but they could open their jaws wide, like twice as much as a lion. And although their teeth were a bit on the weak side, they had buff forearms to pin down their dinner, giving those big fangs a purpose. Not the kind of kitty you'd want to play with. Dire wolves made their debut about 250,000 years ago. They were like the gray wolves we know today, but a lot stronger. While wolves these days stretch out to about 6 feet and tip the scales at 170 pounds max, dire wolves were about 5 feet and about 150 pounds. Found all over North and South America, they had admirable jaws, biting nearly a third harder than their modern counterparts. Also, their favorite snack was horses. But just like many other majestic beasts of the past, they faded away around 10,000 years ago. Now, names can be deceiving. Take the American lion, for example. It's not really a lion, it's more of a panther's big cousin. The other part of the name is correct, though. They did live in America about 330,000 years ago. This feline was no lap cat either. They were at the top of the wildcat pyramid, weighing a colossal 772 pounds. That's like stacking four grown men on a scale. Even the mighty African lion would look a tad bit shy beside these beasts. With the muscle to take down a bison, you wouldn't want to accidentally interrupt their dinner. They parted ways with this planet around 11,000 years ago, right after the last ice age. Now, down in Australia, about 50,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, there lurked a relative of the Komodo dragon, the Megalania. Experts love to have debates on how big it was. Some say it stretched out to 23 feet. Others think it was just about 11 feet long. Either way, they were basically mega-sized Komodo dragons with a dangerous bite. If you think bears are already big and fluffy now, let's introduce the short-faced bear. 
While this big creature stood on its hind legs, it towered at 14 feet. With long limbs, they could outrun today's bears, hitting speeds up to 40 miles per hour. These ultra bears sadly disappeared around 11,600 years ago. Now imagine a crocodile. Okay, imagine that same crocodile, only supersized, with sporty legs doing its thing in Australia about 1.6 million years ago. Well, say hello to the Quincana. These crocs were extremely large, reaching 23 feet. And no, they weren't lazy river loungers. These creatures really love spending time on land. They evolved to have strong legs for their chases and razor-sharp teeth designed for slicing, not gripping. When did we stop sharing beaches with them? About 40,000 years ago. The name elephant bird might not sound familiar, but try to picture a bird that stood tall as high as a basketball hoop at 10 feet and weighed as much as a small car, 1,500 pounds. Their eggs were equally huge, like 150 chicken eggs bundled up into one. Now, as amazing as these birds sound, there's a lot we still don't know about them. They're hard to study, as most extinct animals are. Still, some recent studies have given us some clues. Scientists have been examining ancient molecules from their fossilized eggshells. It's an awesome piece of evidence, since these birdie shells were thick, preserving precious DNA inside. Plus, there are tons of these eggshell fragments sprinkled all over Madagascar's beaches. Because of these findings, we now know these birds were herbivores and loved eating leaves and seeds. We also know the tiny kiwi bird is its closest living relative. Now, dodos were these amazing birds we also used to share the planet with. They're like distant cousins to Asian pigeons. To give you some perspective, imagine a chunky bird weighing about 50 pounds. Similar to chickens, turkeys, and ostriches, dodos were also the types of birds that couldn't fly. Their wings were small, and they had the muscle strength of, well, a wet noodle. Now, you might have heard the word dodo used as a name for creatures that aren't that bright. Don't get confused, though, by this name. These birds were, in fact, intelligent. Scientists were able to figure that out by studying their fossils. It turns out that they were good at smelling stuff, unlike most birds that are all about the visuals. These creatures aren't around for us to study anymore, but that might change. One evolutionary biologist is on a mission to fully understand these amazing ancient birds. On that note, she revealed that the dodo's DNA has been completely sequenced. There are even talks about potentially bringing dodos back to life. They would make a nice addition to the lovely beaches of Mauritius, the place they used to call home many, many years ago. Researchers have been waiting for this find for a long time. They came in all shapes and sizes. It would have been hard to distinguish them from dinosaurs. Most species weren't bigger than a mouse. It's like a reminder of a long-gone era when its ancestors walked on all fours. The first mammals to walk the Earth were different from us humans in one important aspect. We walk on two legs. That makes us bipedal. But the first animals that made the transition from sea to land were tetrapods. This means they walked on four legs. The story of these creatures began in present-day Scotland. The region is home to the first terrestrial ecosystem in the world. The rock here is made from silica. This material is the building block of glass. Hot volcanic springs formed these rocks more than 400 million years ago. Such land composition is a treasure trove for paleontologists. These are the scientists who study the fossil remains of animals and plants. In Scotland, they found everything from plants with preserved cells to the oldest known fossils of insects. They even discovered a fungus that grew up to 29 feet tall. But there was one find that stood out from all the other ones. In 2015, scientists unearthed fossils of four-legged animals. The place of discovery was Willie's Hole, near the hillside village of Chernside in the south of the country. Researchers dated the finds to the Paleozoic era, about 360 million years ago. This was the time when the early ancestors of the dinosaurs thrived. The world was a much different place back then. Today, we associate Scotland with cold and rain, and kilts and golf. 
But at that time, this land sat closer to the equator. It had lush vegetation, and its climate was hot and humid. Droughts and flooding were quite common. It was the perfect setting for an important evolutionary event. Researchers have been waiting for this find for a long time. The fossil records had a 15 million year gap. Its name was Romer's Gap, after the Harvard professor who described it. Science was missing fossil evidence of the animals that ventured onto land on all fours. The five fossil species they found in Scotland shed light on this mystery. The first tetrapods were divided into two large groups. One of them contained the ancestors of birds, reptiles, and mammals. Their collective name is Amniotis. The other included the ancestors of amphibians, such as frogs. When these and similar species migrated to dry land, they discovered that they weren't alone. The earliest life forms that made this evolutionary leap were liverwort-like plants. We know this because scientists found their spores. They also discovered fossilized remains of an air-breathing millipede. It had tiny holes that allowed it to breathe air. This puts it among the first oxygen-breathing animals on the planet. And this species of millipedes is the first land-dweller in the animal kingdom. Today, the largest of such creatures is the African elephant. Scientists believe that one of the first four-legged creatures to make it onto land was an amphibian ancestor. Its name was Istiostega. The first part of the animal's name translates from ancient Greek as fish. This reveals a lot about the way the creature moved. It dragged itself on the ground using only its front limbs that resembled fins. This is the way that mudskipper fish move on land today. This isn't how we imagine proper walking. But during the period our hero lived on Earth, it was the perfect way to get around. The climate had both extremely dry and wet periods. The ability to walk and swim at the same time was especially useful. The fossils from Scotland supported this claim. The fish-like animals scientists found had four slender limbs. This is the perfect equipment for life on land, not inside the ocean. There was further evidence. The fossils displayed well-developed lungs for breathing outside of water. But their legs were still too weak to completely lift the body off the ground. The tail section had to slither along the surface, similar to how a snake moves forward. This animal that resembled a modern-day salamander lived during the Paleozoic era. This was the time when four-legged creatures developed a standard number of digits at the end of their hands and feet, five on each. We know them today as fingers. All species that had more than five fingers started slowly disappearing. These pteropods split into two groups. The first of them had to return to the sea to lay eggs. This group would later give rise to amphibians. The second kind of tetrapods is more interesting to human evolution. They're considered the ancestors of reptiles, dinosaurs, and mammals. The Permian period came at the end of the Paleozoic. By this time, all life forms on Earth inhabited the supercontinent of Pangaea. There were vast deserts far away from the oceans. The more important species that walked on all fours during this time were the synapsids. They came in all shapes and sizes. But the only subgroup of synapsids to survive into the Cenozoic were the mammals. Doesn't seem like much, but we exist today thanks to these ancient tetrapods. As a species, we have come far in the tree of life. A recent study revealed that the first life form to evolve was an ocean-drifting comb jelly. This came as a bit of a surprise. For a long time, researchers believed that the simple sponge was the oldest animal on the planet. After analyzing vast amounts of data, comb jelly came on top. Or the bottom, depending on how you look at the tree of life. These ancient beings were squishy and had tentacles, but they weren't the true jellyfish like the ones we see today. The creatures lacked the bell-shaped body and stinging cells. Scientists cannot precisely date the species because they lack a fossil of the oldest comb jelly. This is not the case with other ancient creatures that once roamed our planet. The ancestor of dinosaurs, turtles, and crocodiles are familiar to science. These are the animals that appeared during the Paleozoic era. This was a time when true tetrapods appeared. Paleontologists recognized them by two distinctive openings on each side of their skull. The first mammals that appeared during this era resembled reptiles. It would have been hard to distinguish them from dinosaurs. 
Some of them later evolved features we all know today. These include fur and a warm-blooded metabolism. They developed during the time when dinosaurs dominated Earth. That's why these first true mammals were small. Most species weren't bigger than a mouse. Their diet consisted of plants, as they were herbivores. Also, they were creatures of the night. During the day, they were mostly hiding underground. Now this wasn't such a bad strategy. Some 66 million years ago, an asteroid fell on the Yucatan Peninsula in today's Mexico. And this spelled the end for dinosaurs. 75% of all species that lived on Earth at the time disappeared. The mammal's small size helped them survive and repopulate the planet. The era in the history of our planet that followed the Mesozoic was nicknamed the Age of the Mammals. The climate became warmer, so grasslands expanded. These were the ideal conditions for tetrapods to grow in size. Some mammals decided not to take this evolutionary path. Bats remained relatively small in size and took to the skies to join birds. And there are some tetrapods that return to the ocean. The most notable example are whales. Today, their closest living relatives are hippos. Both species are aquatic, but they develop this trait separately. The first whales were actually tetrapods. These were the most typical examples of four-legged land animals. If you saw them today, you would think they were oversized rats. That's what whales looked like some 50 million years ago. Paleontologists came to this conclusion in the 1980s by studying the skull of a now extinct animal. It lived around the edge of a large, shallow ocean. At some point in history, it returned to the marine way of life. Its back legs devolve. But sometimes, biologists stumble upon a living specimen of a whale that still displays tiny hind limbs in its skeleton. It's like a reminder of a long-gone era when its ancestors walked on all fours. Texas is home to some of the oddest, creepiest, and most unusual animals you've ever heard of. It might come as a surprise, but this state is full of creatures you'll hardly see in other places. So, let's have a look at the most amazing ones. This truly beautiful bright blue creature is called the Blue Sea Dragon. Despite such an imposing name, the critter is actually tiny. Usually no bigger than a grape. You may find it on the beach or floating beside you in the water. Now, you need to remember one thing. However pretty this little slug may look, never ever touch it. One tourist spotted a few of these pretty dragons on the shore of Mustang Island. He scooped one of the creatures up. He wanted to film it. Luckily, he put it back into the water before it could sting him. Otherwise, it would have ended badly since the Blue Sea Dragon is venomous. Despite their tiny size, their sting can pack a punch. All because of their diet. Their favorite dish is the Portuguese man o war a jellyfish that has enough venom to paralyze small fish and crustaceans. The blue dragons first use mucus to neutralize the jellyfish's infamous stinging cells. And then they steal these cells from the man o war's tentacles and store and concentrate them within their own tissues. Then they release these stinging cells on contact which makes their own sting more powerful, even worse than that of the man o war itself. These awesome creatures are also extremely sneaky. Even though their appearance is bright, to say the least, they're well-known masters of disguise. You see that vibrant blue coloring is actually on their bellies. And when they float on their backs, they simply blend with the water. As for their backs, they're gray to camouflage these animals on the seafloor. Now how about a funny fact? A group of tiny dragons floating together is called a blue fleet. And another fact, blue dragons normally lay a string of around 16 eggs. And it takes them three days or so to hatch into larvae. Blue sea dragons rarely make it to the shore. They're soft-bodied, so when the animals finally get through the surf zone and are deposited on the shore, they're already broken apart. And still, watch out! Even in this case, the venom in their bodies doesn't dissipate. But of course, blue sea dragons aren't the only unusual animals inhabiting Texas. Have a look at this nightmarish creature. Poisonous, slimy, and kinda immortal. Meet the hammerhead worm. The worst thing? 
It might be lurking in your garden while you're watching this video. You can easily recognize this worm by its creepy spade-shaped head. It doesn't look like any other invertebrate you've ever seen. Or any other creature, that is. At first, it was only found in East Texas. But later, researchers spotted these spine-chilling creatures in North, Central, and South Texas. Basically everywhere but the arid areas of West Texas. One of the most terrifying things about this worm might be its length. This creature can grow as long as one foot. Luckily, such giants aren't very common. Most hammerhead worms only reach 6 inches in length. You can come across two species of these worms in Texas, and both of them will have a dark stripe down the middle. The larger of these two species munches on earthworms, which is actually a big problem. You might know that earthworms play an important role in keeping the soil rich in minerals and overall healthy. If earthworms disappear, plants in such areas won't be getting the nutrients they need. Even for humans and pets, meeting a hammerhead worm isn't the most pleasant experience either. Hammerheads are the only terrestrial invertebrates that secrete a very dangerous neurotoxin, the same as pufferfish produce. Thanks to the sheer size of the human body, touching a hammerhead worm won't hurt you too much, but it may still cause your hand to start tingling or even go numb. It's much more dangerous for pets. There have been cases when dogs ate hammerheads which left them feeling sick for the whole day. Interestingly, these worms are native to Southeast Asia. But they must have mastered the art of hitchhiking, since in the early 1900s they were already found in the US. Keep in mind that if you want to get rid of a hammerhead worm, which is the best course of action, the worst thing you can do is chop it with a shovel. The thing is, flatworms reproduce by ripping themselves in half. So by cutting it, you actually help the populations of the worms, turning one into two. That's the reason why hammerheads are sometimes described as immortal, which is a bit of a stretch since these creatures can't survive in vinegar or salt. Now even though you're safe from the hammerhead worm in West Texas, it doesn't mean you can't come across another dangerous animal, such as the land lobster from hell. These creatures are also known as vinegaroons, and they're not real crustaceans, they're arachnids! Huh? Who would have guessed? Anyway, these eight-legged critters have a really nasty bite, but it's not the worst thing about them. Land lobsters? Brace yourself! Spray vinegar-like 85% acid from their tails! Mostly they do it to protect themselves, but it still sounds like an unfriendly thing to do, right? A land lobster can also pinch a finger that's gotten too close with its heavy mouth parts. At the base of their abdomens, vinegaroons have long whip-like tails. That's why these arachnids are often called whip scorpions, even though they're neither related to scorpions nor have stingers. Summer rains lure these arachnids out of their burrows in search of food and love. Luckily, experts claim that land lobsters aren't poisonous to humans but they're very likely to leave a mark with their large pinchers, which they use to capture insects. Vinegaroons can be considered useful since they eat millipedes, crickets, scorpions, and cockroaches. They hunt by sensing the vibrations of their prey with those long front legs of theirs. Since land lobsters prefer to come out after dark, you aren't likely to see one in the daylight. But if you stumble upon one, check it out. If it's a female, it may be carrying her hatchlings on her back. Now, imagine it's the middle of spring and you're walking among blooming flowers and greenery. Suddenly, you spot something extremely bizarre on the ground. The animal looks cute, fluffy, and soft-looking. The desire to touch it is irresistible. Watch out! The sting of the hairy caterpillar can pack a serious punch. This one is called the pus moth caterpillar, or asp. There are several stinging caterpillar species in Texas. The buck moth caterpillar, spiny oak slug caterpillar, saddleback caterpillar, and eo moth caterpillar. And touching any of them can lead to unpleasant consequences. If you had touched that pretty hairy thing in the park, 
you'd most likely start feeling a burning sensation and develop an itchy rash. In the worst case scenario, you'd even have to go to the emergency room. The main problem is that people react very differently to caterpillar toxins. Some may develop more severe reactions than others. Plus, how bad the consequences are also depends on the thickness of the skin in the affected area. In most cases, the unpleasant sensation and rash go away in a few hours or sometimes days. On the bright side, such caterpillars later turn into moths and butterflies that help pollinate flowers and trees. Getting rid of these critters means doing a massive disservice to the area where you live. Specialists are sure that coming across a stinging caterpillar won't lead to anything bad if you keep in mind the rule of thumb. If a caterpillar looks fuzzy, don't touch it. And the best solution to dealing with such creatures is educating people on what such caterpillars are, what they look like, and why it's dangerous to touch them with unprotected hands. Alrighty, folks, gather around and let me tell you about the Mananangal, a real charmer of a mythical creature from Filipino folklore. She's often described as a lady who likes to snack on sleeping pregnant women. But here's the twist. During the day, she's all dolled up and looking like a total babe. But come nightfall, she detaches her torso and spreads her massive bat-like wings to fly off into the darkness in search of her next victim. And she doesn't just stop at pregnant ladies. Nope. Sometimes she'll use her good looks to lead astray men and take them to her secret hiding spot where she'll feast on their heart, intestines, and other internal organs all night long. Yikes. If you're ever faced with a Mananangal and want to stop her from reattaching her body before sunrise, just sprinkle some salt, ash, or crushed garlic on the remaining half of her body. Easy peasy, right? So keep an eye out for this winged wonder and don't forget the garlic! Okay, so check this out. In German folklore, there's this crazy creature called an owl. Basically, it's like a vampire, mixed with an incubus. And it wears this dope hat called a tarn cap that gives it all kinds of powers. This dude is all about preying on women at night by messing with their dreams. Oh, and it's into breast milk and sucking the blood of men and kids. The Alp can shapeshift into all kinds of stuff, like cats, pigs, dogs, snakes, and even butterflies. And it's got this evil eye that can totally mess you up with bad luck or sickness. But don't worry, you can protect yourself by hiding a broomstick under your pillow pointing your shoes towards the door, hanging iron horseshoes from the bedpost, or putting a mirror on your chest. And if all else fails, just leave the lights on all night and shove a lemon in its mouth if you catch it napping during the day. Meet the Pontia Nuck, a spooky ghost from Malay mythology. Legend has it that she was a woman who passed away while giving birth, and now she's out for revenge. She's not your average ghost either. She's got long black hair, sharp fingernails, and a blood-smeared white dress. But watch out, because she's also a master of disguise. She can transform into a beautiful woman to lure in her prey before ripping out their insides. If you're ever out at night and hear the cries of babies or feminine laughter, beware. That could be the Pontianuk coming to get you. And if the sounds are quiet, she might be right around the corner. So keep your wits about you, and don't fall for any too-good-to-be-true ladies. Hey, did you know that according to Irish legend, every family has their very own banshee? This banshee lady is supposed to let out a piercing wail or shout when someone in the family is about to kick the bucket. Talk about a not-so-subtle warning, but don't let her eerie cry trick you. This banshee lady is said to be drop-dead gorgeous with long flowing locks and crimson eyes from all her crying. She's also known for wearing a gray shawl over her green threads. Fashionable and spooky? We're into it. Some people even say that this banshee can transform into a sweet singing young lady who foretells the doom of the family. Yikes. And if that's not enough to give you goosebumps, she's also been spotted hunched over in the woods, crying her eyes out at night. Sounds like a real party animal, doesn't she? So next time you hear a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the night, just remember, it might just be your friendly neighborhood banshee giving you a heads up. Now let me tell you about the Kalu Piluit. These creatures are like the boogeyman of the Arctic. 
They live near the ice flows and are known for snatching up kids who get too close to the water. But don't worry, it's just a myth to keep children safe. Now, the appearance of these critters varies from story to story, but they all have some things in common. They've got slimy green skin, long hair, and long fingernails. Their hands are webbed like a fish, and they wear these fancy parkas made out of eider duck feathers. Oh, and watch out for their flippers. One of them can emit a sound that'll paralyze you. But don't fret, you can outsmart them. Some clever Inuit hunters figured out that if they asked the Kalupiluit to shapeshift into a seal or whale, they could easily finish it and bring home a tasty catch. Yum! Some stories say that these creatures use kidnapped children to keep their hair looking fabulous. Talk about dedication to hair care. Others say that the kids are just devoured or used to fuel the Kalapiluit's youth. But here's a wild tale for you. There was once a grandma who couldn't feed her grandson, so she called upon a Kalapiluit to take him away. The tribe eventually got back on their feet, and a young couple went to rescue the boy. They found him tethered to seaweed by the Kalapiluit. But every time they got close, she'd drag him back underwater. They ended up waiting until sunrise to cut him loose. Yeah, the Kalupiluit may be spooky, but they're just looking out for the kiddos. And who knows? Maybe they'll give you some hair care tips if you're lucky enough to meet one. Let me present to you the scariest horse-like monster in all of Scotland. The Nuklavi, or Nukalavi. This bad boy has a skinless body, a head ten times bigger than a human's, and a breath so poisonous it can destroy animals and crops. So, it's got wicked powers that can cause chaos all over the islands. But fear not, because there's an old spirit known as the Sea Mither who can control this terrifying beast during the summer months. The Nukalavi has roots in Norse and Orcadian folklore, and was first documented by the mysterious Joe Ben using some fancy Latin manuscripts back in the 16th century. Ernest Marwick, an Orcadian writer and folklorist, thinks that this evil sea creature is similar to the Norwegian Nock, the Nuggle of the Shetland, and the shape-shifting Kelpie, or Water Kelpie. So, if you're ever out and about in Scotland and come across this scary guy, just remember, call on the Sea Mither and run for your life. This dude is South African Tokolosha. It may look like a gremlin, but trust me, it's way more mischievous. Apparently, witches and shamans can summon them with their magical powers, but there are ways to keep these troublemakers in check. One way is to give them some curdled milk. Apparently, it's their favorite. And trim their hair so they can see. If that doesn't work, you can call in a witch doctor to use some good old-fashioned magic to exercise them away. Now, according to South African folklore, these tokaloshes are mostly invisible and can suck on a stone to stay that way. So, if you want to keep them away from your home, scatter some special blessed salts, aka tokaloshe salts, along your door frames and windowsills. Or if you're feeling extra cautious, put some bricks under your bed's legs. Better safe than sorry, right? Have you heard of the Chimera? She's a total monster, literally. This fire-breathing female hybrid is made up of all sorts of animal parts. Think lion-like body, goat-like head, and a tail that ends in a snake's head. According to Greek mythology, the Chimera is the child of Typhon and Echidna, and her sisters are Cerberus and Lernaean Hydra. Sounds like a family reunion, huh? But don't worry, our hero Bellerophon was up for the challenge. The King of Lycia sent him on a mission to defeat the fearsome Chimera. And Bellerophon was the greatest hero monsters were scared of. The Chimera was no match for Bellerophon and his trusty Pegasus. Even though the King was secretly hoping the Chimera would take out Bellerophon instead, in the end, justice prevailed and the Chimera was defeated. Well, that's it for today. It's a beautiful day. A family's having a picnic on a creek in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Everything seems normal. But suddenly, they spot a thin woman in an old-fashioned gown floating over the water towards a hill. The picnic instantly turns into a horror movie. The lady vanishes just to reappear a moment later much closer. Before the family manages to react or say hi, she disappears again. This story happened in the 1930s, and was later told by the family's son, Patricio Lujan. The mysterious lady left no footprints, and the family was sure they'd met a local celebrity. The weeping woman 
or La Llorona, is one of the major spooky figures in Mexican folklore. Although no one knows exactly when or where the tale originated, it's been part of the culture since the conquistadors days. La Llorona is a wailing phantom, usually depicted as a tall, pretty woman in a white gown with long black hair. But those who claim to see her warn that her beauty is deceiving. She can attack people and even drag them into the water. The details of the legend vary, but here's the most common narrative. There once lived a Mexican woman, Maria, who was very beautiful. One day a man of a higher social status visited her village, fell in love, and they got married. The couple lived peacefully, isolated from the husband's high-class roots. And they had several children. But unlike Cinderella, Maria didn't live happily ever after. Her husband got bored and began to disappear for extended periods of time. Some versions say he abandoned Maria to marry a woman of higher status. Others say he was drinking and womanizing. Some speculate that he wanted to separate Maria and her children to integrate them into his aristocratic world, where their mother would never fit into. In any case, she failed to cope with his betrayal. Driven by rage, she went to the river and did something, well, unsportsmanlike. Which left her husband a childless widower. So, there you have it. A regular woman turned into a monstrous phantom, La Llorona. According to the legend, she can't rest in peace because she's cursed to spend eternity wandering around rivers and lakes in search of forgiveness. Some say she may kidnap other children, confusing them with hers. But according to other versions, this phantom prefers to haunt unfaithful husbands and bad mothers. It's no wonder that parents use this legend to scare kids and blackmail them into obedience. But hey! There's more to this story than meets the eye. Let's take a look at the historical context in which La Llorona emerged. In the 16th century, Mexico was facing disputes with the Spanish conquistadors. Meanwhile, the outlander's leader, Hernán Cortés, had a relationship with a local woman known as La Malinche. As part of the peace agreement, 20 indigenous women, including La Malinche, were doomed to serve Cortés and his European followers. Born to a noble family, La Malinche had some useful skills and a diplomatic approach. First, she became Cortez's personal translator, and then his mistress and mother of his son. La Malinche didn't get her happily ever after either. Cortez abandoned her to marry a Spanish lady. As for their son, he was recognized as legitimate, separated from his mother, and sent to Spain for education. The majority of historians agree that La Malenche played a crucial role in the country's transformation. Some call her a traitor, others believe she couldn't have acted differently in those circumstances. In any case, the similarities between the legend of La Llorona and La Malenche are obvious. Both were neglected by a wealthy outlander who wanted to take their children away. And both stories can be seen as an embodiment of misunderstanding between indigenous people and incoming Europeans. So the reason La Llorona is such an iconic figure lies in the cultural climate. Her myth tells us what La Malinche might have done had she allowed anger to get the best of her. Some believe that La Llorona is challenging traditional patriarchy, while others see her as a sad symbol of despair. But for those who claim to meet her in real life, this wailing phantom is more than just a spooky myth. At first, people reported seeing and hearing La Llorona crying near the bodies of water in Mexico. And eventually, her presence spread to nearby territories, including the United States. Over the years, the legend flourished with further details and locations, such as villages, roads, and even railway stations. There were reports about a La Llorona appearing in the back seat of those cars whose drivers refused to stop and give her a ride. So, if you ever see a spooky, wailing lady hitchhiking on the road, be prepared. It's a tricky dilemma, though. Would you rather stop and give La Llorona a ride, or drive by hoping she won't take revenge on you? <laughs> Let us know in the comments. According to urban legends, the Santa Fe River is one of her favorite places to go. 
La Llorona has been repeatedly seen in the Public Employees Retirement Association building, which is located nearby. The local employees reported hearing her cries resounding through the walls. Moreover, they felt invisible hands pushing them while walking down the stairs. Oh my! But still meeting a phantom at your workplace is not as scary as seeing her staring at you through the window of your own bedroom. One winter night, a girl from Santa Fe who was 12 years old when it happened was sitting in her room with a cousin. It was snowing outside. Suddenly, they heard a noise from the street. A mysterious, pale lady was standing by the window, dressed all in white and crying. They called their parents who rushed outside to investigate, but they found no footprints on the fallen snow. It's getting creepier. Here's a story posted online by a woman from Lompoc, a small town in California. One night, when she was only 8 years old, she had a huge dispute with her mom. Finally, she was told to go to bed. She tossed and turned, but she couldn't fall asleep. Suddenly, she noticed someone standing by her bed. It was a lady in a black dress. She had a creepy smile on her face and two black holes instead of eyes. Her long black hair was blowing in the wind. The mysterious guest wouldn't go away, so they kept on staring at each other for a while. And then the girl got tired and fell asleep. After that, she began to experience strange events in that house after that very night. It's no wonder that this wailing entity has inspired so many plays, TV shows, and movies over the years. The earliest written reference dates to the late 19th century. Mexican poet Manuel Carpio wrote a sonnet, La Llorona. However, his poem is about a phantom of a woman whose life was taken by her husband. One of her latest appearances on the screen was in 2018. She was portrayed as a main villain in the movie The Curse of La Llorona. Also, this phantom has a huge impact on music. You must have heard about the Mexican folk song titled La Llorona. It's been out there for so long that nobody knows its exact origin. It was first recorded in 1949 by a famous composer and songwriter, Andres Hines Rosa, and has since been performed and covered by numerous musicians all over the globe. In 2017, the song popped out in a Disney film, Coco. If you're in love with the spooky and bright features of Mexican folklore, then you should check out this cartoon. It's the story of a young Mexican guitar player who's taking a trip around the fancy afterlife world to investigate his family's history. And remember, if you ever find yourself in the middle of a forest alone at night and hearing a weeping lady, eh, don't rush to run away. Chances are, you'll have the most genuine talk about the ugly side of patriarchy and make a new friend. Be careful, because that eerie guy is after your brains. But shh, listen up. He's actually groaning, murky. It turns out the very first zombie tale was written over 4,000 years ago in this extinct Akkadian language. The text, discovered in 1849 in the ancient city of Nineveh, remained a mystery for 23 years until a man called George Smith finally cracked the enigmatic code. He found that this clay tablet was one of the missing pieces of the Epic of Gilgamesh, probably the oldest written work of literature that we know of. It tells the story of a Sumerian king named Gilgamesh who found himself way too close to a zombie apocalypse. But before we all share the same destiny, make sure to like this video and hit that subscribe button. In the story, Gilgamesh turns down a marriage proposal from Ishtar, the deity of love. That really ticks her off, so she asks her parents to lend her a mythical beast called Bull of Heaven to deal with Gilgamesh. At first, her parents were like, Hmm, no, not happening. But they quickly changed their mind after Ishtar threatened to unleash deceased people from the underworld to feast on the living. In her terrifying vision, the departed would outnumber the living. No thanks. Anyway, these words are credited as the first mention of a zombie apocalypse in world literature. I mean, it has all the ingredients, reanimated humans that feed on the flesh of the living. 
and a scenario that becomes chaotic and dangerous, not because zombies are super skilled, but simply because there are tons of them. But not everyone buys into the idea that the Epic of Gilgamesh mentioned the first zombie apocalypse ever, especially when they compare the creatures from the ancient poem to what we call zombies today. And there are two significant differences between them. The first difference relates to zombie appearances. You see, the first time a reanimated human appeared on the silver screen was in 1932 with the movie White Zombie. In the story, a man is convinced to turn his ex-lover into a zombie to make her fall in love with him, as if there are no other ways, right? So imagine a zombie movie without colors or special effects makeup, just a soulless blonde woman. Yep, that's White Zombie, and it can be entirely meh. As time passed, these creatures needed a makeover to become more terrifying. So movie producers improved the zombie's appearance with special effects until it reached a disturbing new level with World War Z. The point is that whether it's a character from White Zombie or World War Z, if you encountered one of these creatures on the street, you'd be certain you saw a zombie. After all, they share common characteristics such as pale skin, a lack of expression, and a bizarre walk. But I bet you wouldn't be sure when checking out the zombies from the Epic of Gilgamesh. After all, they're described as bird-looking creatures, resembling eerie humans covered in feathers, which normally feed on dirt, not brains. Well, the second difference lies in how the zombie apocalypse starts. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, Ishtar embraced the whole resentful necromancer vibe by threatening to bring deceased people back from the underworld, like she was waking them up from a deep sleep. This way of making a body rise from the underground was also frequently explored in classic zombie movies, where reanimated corpses suddenly started to come out of their graves. But nowadays, zombie apocalypse stories need a more believable explanation to really get us hooked. So current movies and video games tend to attribute zombification to a medicine gone bad kind of scenario. The realistic concept was taken to the max in The Last of Us, where they attributed the outbreak to a fungal pathogen called cordyceps. It started affecting humans after a nasty mutation. In this case, the plot feels incredibly real because this is indeed a real fungus that parasitizes the brains of insects like ants or spiders. But don't worry, an uncontrollable fungus-driven zombie apocalypse in real life is highly unlikely. Besides those two big differences, there's another reason why people may think that Epic of Gilgamesh doesn't talk about zombies. Well, that's because Ishtar doesn't really use the word zombie, or ghouls, or walkers. This theory points out that the love deity threat was actually about feared risen spirits, common in Mesopotamian mythology. Much like the Akimas, the ghosts of people who weren't granted a proper burial, they were thought to be vengeful towards the living, especially when certain rules were not followed, such as abstaining from eating ox meat. So Ishtar could be implying that the deceased would outnumber the living in a spiritual form, not a physical one. So it does sound more like ghosts than zombies. This interpretation is quite interesting. But the most likely reason she didn't use the word zombie is that there wasn't this term back then. See, in English, the word was printed for the first time in a newspaper only in 1838 in a short story called The Unknown Painter that spelled zombie without the E at the end. While there's no clear agreement on where it really came from, some scholars claim that the word zombie most likely originated in West Africa, derived from the Congo word zambi, which means soul. Back then, the term was very much related to a corpse that was reanimated through magic or witchcraft, not resentful goddesses. The Epic of Gilgamesh is proof that zombie legends are nearly as ancient as writing itself, meaning that we've been fearing them for the same amount of time. The creepiest thing about zombies is probably the fact that they are essentially us. All zombies have been living their lives just like we do, having morning coffees and stressing over bills before whatever it was that overcame them occurred. So we kind of relate to them in a weird way. 
Today, the fear of zombies is commonly known as kinemortophobia, and to illustrate one of the possible reasons behind it, you should stare at this photo for a bit. Okay, so I bet your first quick thought was, it's a woman. Then you probably realized that something was off, as if this woman lacked humanity somehow. Finally, it hit you. It's a portrait made by AI. This is an example of the uncanny valley, a concept that suggests that many people might feel uneasy when dealing with something that is almost human but not quite. The same disturbing feeling can happen when we watch zombie movies. Though they still have human form, they are no longer connected to us. And that gives us an unsettling sensation. This idea makes sense today with a dose of great acting and special effects makeup. But that couldn't be the reason why people feared zombies in the 7th century before the Common Era. Well, a theory says those ancient tales originated from our natural fear of rotting corpses. Back in the old times, if a person passed away from a contagious illness, their corpse could still be infected and could possibly spread the contagion to those touching it. Zombies will never let us go. After all, movies and books always find a new way to make the outbreaks tap into our current fears. Nowadays, with modern medicine being so advanced, the idea of a zombie apocalypse probably doesn't seem as terrifying. I mean, we'd expect experts to find a cure pretty quickly, right? In 2017, the movie The Cured explored this concept. After a zombie plague dominated Europe, experts discovered a cure to save 75% of the infected. Ex-zombies hoped to go back to their regular lives, but reintegration was not that easy since people couldn't forget what they did as flesh-eating creatures. This challenging situation shows us that even cured zombies can still give us the chills. But let's hope all these dilemmas will remain within the realm of fiction. A new Twilight TV series is in the works. That means one question will surely spark some conversation again. Are you Team Edward or Team Jacob? Well, I can help you pick a side. You see, the longtime rivalry between werewolves or vampires was one of the main plot points of the saga. But it's neither the first nor the last entertainment series to depict the eternal conflict between these two monsters. And you might be surprised that this clash is not really eternal. Most real-life legends and folklore mention little or nothing about any animosity between these two supernaturals. This trope has actually been popularized through various films and books over the years. The 1944 movie House of Frankenstein and its sequel, House of Dracula, that came a year later, were the first two films in which there was shared screen time of both the vampire and the werewolf characters. Still, there were no traces of a feud in both of them. But the movies were incredibly successful in uniting these creatures of the night in a thrilling monster mashup that the studio released one last comedy horror film to conclude the series in 1948. With that, Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein became the first movie to show a werewolf fighting against a vampire. Yet again, the notion of a well-established rivalry between these creatures didn't gain popularity until several decades later. It was the emergence of two of the most popular film series, aka Underworld and Van Helsing movies, which further helped shape this rivalry. What made the Twilight Saga different from these, however, was the fact that it used not only a primal rivalry, but a rivalry in love as well. There are quite a few TV shows that jumped on the fur against fangs bandwagon too. Penny Dreadful has an episode in which it pits two against Dracula and his nest of vampires. In its second season, The Vampire Diaries introduced the idea that a transformed werewolf's bite is fatal to a vampire, and vampires were created specifically to be able to hunt werewolves. The dark comedy show What We Do in the Shadows suggests werewolves can be turned into vampires. But you know what? To understand the vampire-werewolf rivalry within the world of monsters itself, we better delve deep into the origins of these supernatural beings. If we were to do some brainstorming around the word werewolf, the list of elements that will come to our minds might include these. The full moon, silver, hairy half-man, lycanthropy, aka the ability to transform into a wolf, and an incurable curse. 
But you see, the concept of werewolf as we know it today has been through many transformations, pun intended. For example, there are more ways one can become a werewolf than to get bit, and the change isn't always out of control or permanent. Yet again, one thing remains constant both in horror movies and old monster tales. Werewolves are usually depicted as cunning, fast, agile, and evil, which makes them truly dangerous and terrifying. Then, accordingly, one might assume this aggressive creature originated from the medieval and early modern eras, born out of the superstitions associated with medicine, magic, or witchcraft, like many other myths and legends. But in reality, the origins of the werewolf extend much further back in history. And the fascinating thing is, similar kinds of transforming into vicious animal types of stories exist in so many cultures around the world. Although tracking down the exact origin of the werewolf legend is tricky. The Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest known written works on the planet, is a likely candidate. In it, Gilgamesh refuses to become the lover of the female deity Ishtar due to her mistreatment of her past suitors. And by mistreatment, I mean she turned a shepherd into a wolf, which consequently made him the enemy of his own sheep and dogs. However, the werewolf as we know it today first appeared in ancient Greece and Rome in ethnographic, poetic, and philosophical texts. For example, Greek historian Herodotus described a nomadic tribe of magical men who changed into wolves once every year for several days, and then changed back to their human shape. By the way, Ovid's text is one of the only ancient sources that goes into detail on how the transformation happens. So it's fair to say this early portrayal has significantly shaped the monstrous werewolf archetype in modern fiction. In addition to the 1941 movie, The Wolfman, that is. And there's one other fun fact. Lycaon's name and the word lycanthropy both come from the Greek word lykos, which means wolf. Just connecting the dots here. According to werewolf lore, being placed under a powerful curse or getting punished for your nasty actions is not the only thing that will turn you into one. Several Northern European stories describe articles of clothing like belts that allow the wearer to become a wolf. And in those cases, the werewolfness is more like a gift rather than a curse. In addition, you can also become a werewolf if you get bit by one. Well, to be clear, this belief is not really part of the original myths and legends. It comes from later works of fiction as well as pop culture. The same thing goes for the notion of werewolves being vulnerable to silver self-defense tools. The movie The Wolfman I just mentioned also contributed to both of these notions which made them what they are today, by being the first movie to cinematically adopt them. However, it needs to be noted that the first movie to feature the transformative effect of the full moon was not The Wolfman, but Frankenstein meets The Wolfman which premiered a year later. Today, werewolves are depicted as more heroic creatures rather than malevolent. And series like Twilight, Underworld, and even Harry Potter with Professor Lupin are perfect examples of that. Now let's do the same brainstorming for vampires. This time, our list of elements might include stuff like blood, fangs, bats, mirrors, garlic, wooden stakes, and perhaps sunscreen? So although cultures such as the Mesopotamians, ancient Greeks, Manipuri, and Romans had tales of evil supernatural beings that are considered precursors to modern vampires, the folklore for the entity known as the vampire today originates almost exclusively from early 18th century southeastern Europe when the oral traditions of different ethnic groups in the region were documented. In fact, the concept of a vampire as a creature of the night that inflicts harm even postdates the witch hunt era. If there's one thing we can all agree on, that would be there's no talking about vampires without talking about Bram Stoker's book, Dracula, which was published in 1897. The vampiric traits described in Stoker's work got merged with and even dominated folkloric traditional stories and it eventually gave rise to the modern fictional vampire we know today. Examples of such vampiric characteristics include having and using supernatural abilities, such as mind control and shape-shifting to prey upon innocent victims belonging to aristocracy, 
or being from Transylvania. But what it doesn't have is the depiction of vampires being vulnerable to sunlight. That actually belonged to the 1922 movie Nosferatu, which was in turn inspired by the book itself. Other aspects of the movie were so similar to Stoker's novel that the widow sued for copyright infringement and got many copies of the film to be subsequently destroyed. If only there was YouTube back then! In the 20th century, vampires started to be depicted as having a broader range of human characteristics rather than being purely animalistic evil creatures. An earlier example of work that has such a sympathetic vampire as its protagonist is Marilyn Ross's Barnabas Collins series which is loosely based on the contemporary American TV series Dark Shadows. This also set the trend for emotionally vulnerable, moral, or misunderstood romantic hero vampires as we see in Anne Rice's Vampire Chronicles and The Twilight Saga. So you see, there are many similarities between vampires and werewolves, like their lust for blood or their shape-shifting abilities. Then again, their equal yet alternate strengths make them formidable foes as they represent different aspects of human nature. Vampires, the more sophisticated side that has a taste for luxury, whereas werewolves, the wild and aggressive side with a deep connection to nature. How heavy is the largest living snake? How can a snake eat a whale? Get ready, I'm about to answer these questions. Before the last ice age, giant mammals like mammoths ruled the world. The modern animal kingdom we're familiar with was shaped around 55 million years ago. I mean, there were still 1,000-pound bear dogs living from Asia to America. But modern whales, for instance, began to appear later. I'm saying modern whales because, surprise, surprise, whales weren't always fully aquatic. The ancestors of the ocean's biggest animals once walked on dry land. They had four legs and lived on the coast. Now, I want to introduce you to a snake that used to eat these whales, the Palaeophys, a genus of a marine snake. Scientists say it's hard to understand how big the Palaeophys was due to its fragmentary fossil record. They assume that it could have reached up to 40 feet long. Its fossils were found in different parts of the world, from England to Morocco and Virginia, USA. The Phileophys is extinct now, and sea snakes today are only about a quarter of the size this majestic creature used to be. So no need to worry about this underwater monster. But there once was an even bigger snake, the Titan Boa. It was around 50 feet long and most likely weighed over a ton. It used to live in what is now known as northeastern Colombia around 60 to 58 million years ago. Scientists say that it mostly fed on fish. Another giant animal that lived in the past was the black Gigantopithecus. These primates aren't related to gorillas. They lived in the area of modern China. Some people believe that they're still alive, but so far, no one has laid eyes on them. Some people even go further and say that the stories of Bigfoot or Yeti are based on these animals. This rodent became extinct about 2 million years ago. Its main habitat was South America, more specifically Uruguay. What's astonishing about this species is that it was the largest rodent ever known. It was bigger than a bull. Scientists believe that it weighed up to 1,000 pounds. A distant relative of this rodent is still alive today. It's called the Pacarana. It's a rare animal that lives in South America. It weighs up to 33 pounds and measures up to 31 inches, not including its cute and fluffy tail. The Arthropleura was an insect that lived in prehistoric times. Imagine a giant millipede measuring up to 8 feet in length. Here you go. It was one of the largest land animals of its era, about 315 million years ago. The Arthropleura's shell was covered with tough plates. These plates were there to protect the creature from damage. Most of the time, it burrowed into the ground to avoid becoming some other animal's dinner. Meet the Megalodon. Millions of years ago, this shark lived in the ocean and ate other marine creatures. It had wide teeth and its jaws were so powerful that the animal could finish off its prey with the force of its bite. 
It was one of the largest sharks to ever exist. Yet, this predator also went extinct. Scientists don't really know the reason. This made me wonder why animals were so big in the past. Nowadays, smaller creatures flee or hide from predators. But apparently, it wasn't like this before. Many centuries ago, animals didn't just run or hide, they fought back. Research suggests that this behavior may have been the most important motivation for prey to grow bigger. A study compared the skulls of ancient animals to those of their modern peers. The skulls of predatory animals have become shorter and narrower, while the skulls of the animals they hunted have become longer and broader. This means that predators learned to become experts in hunting, while prey worked on developing their defense skills. You see, a larger body size was a great advantage because it made it harder for predators to take down the animals they hunted. The bottom line? Self-defense made prehistoric animals larger. The second reason why ancient animals were larger is related to their bones. They had hollow bones, which are lighter than solid bones. This type of bone allowed large animals to move quickly. Let's take sauropods. They were a dinosaur subgroup. Sauropods had giraffe-like long necks and snake-like long tails. Compared to their body size, their head was really tiny. But since their bones were quite light, they could move around without having to carry additional weight. The eating habits of these animals were also related to their body size. When experts examined the fossils of one extinct mammal species, they found out that these animals had a diet that was high in nutrients and low in fiber. And this mammal was the largest land animal of its period. In other words, following this diet, mammals could grow to be very large. There was plenty of food out there, so they didn't have to worry about finding it. Fun fact, these animals also took chewing out of the picture. They could swallow their food in large pieces instead of taking small bites. Environmental conditions also played an important role in the evolution of larger animals in prehistoric times. Those animals tended to live in warm, moist climates that provided them with a lot of food. They didn't have to compete for food sources. Researchers believe that because of these conditions, natural selection worked in a certain way. I mean, body size was more important than such traits as agility and speed. Oh, and did you know that large animals tend to produce more carbon dioxide? And ultimately, a bigger volume of carbon dioxide increases the amount of vegetation in the animal's habitat. As for the abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere at that time, it could be another vital element for some animal's growth. A good but scary example of an animal that benefited from the high levels of oxygen can be the cockroach of the Paleozoic era. At that time, cockroaches were the size of modern house cats. Now this one would give me the chills if I ever faced it. Ugh. What about today? Well, there are over 3,000 species of snakes on Earth. The smallest snake in the world is the Barbados thread snake. It's only around 4 inches long when fully grown. And the largest one? It's the reticulated python. This snake reaches around 20 feet in length. The longest python was discovered in 1912. It measured 32 feet long. As for the largest and heaviest reticulated python, it was named Medusa. Medusa was approximately 25 feet long and weighed 350 pounds. These reptiles lived in Southeast Asia in rainforests, woodlands, and grasslands. Don't be confused though, the reticulated python isn't the heaviest snake in the world. This title belongs to the green anaconda. It weighs approximately 500 pounds. Green anacondas are found in South America and Trinidad in damp, humid areas. I have a bonus for you. Here is a flying snake. You can find these snakes in Southeast Asia. They don't fly like birds, of course, but they do use the power of flight. They can go as high as 300 feet. They leap from tree branches into the air. Once they take off, it's all about aerodynamics. Their main technique is flaring their ribs and pulling in their abdomens. While airborne, they undulate from one side to another and slightly up and down. This motion helps snakes to turn and glide. 
Why bother with all this if they can just crawl in an old school way? Scientists aren't sure, but they believe it might be related to escaping from predators. This way, they move from one tree to another without having to get down to the ground. Every now and then, people discover fossils of animals that lived millions of years ago. These ancient discoveries continue to capture our imagination. Which of these animals would you like to see alive? Consider the poor werewolves. They're a big deal in legends, movies, TV shows, and books. But nobody knows for sure when or where the whole werewolf thing started. Some people think it could have been the old epic of Gilgamesh, where a guy turned his lover into a wolf. The earliest tale of a man-to-wolf change can be found there, dating all the way back to 2100 BCE. But the real werewolf stories as we know them today come from ancient Greece and Rome. They had mythical and magical texts where people turned into wolves. Plato and others say there was this mythical king named Lycuon, who had quite a wild tale. He and his sons pulled some dirty business behind Zeus's back. Zeus was not happy and turned Lycuon into a wolf. Note to self, if you get on Zeus's nerves, you could be turned into a wolf as punishment. This person's physical form changed into a wolf all because of his unruly behavior. That's when the idea of monstrous werewolf appeared in our stories. It's not just ancient Greeks who had tales about werewolves. Vikings also had their werewolf story, and so did Germanic people. For example, the Saga of the Volk Songs talks about a father and son who wore wolf pelts and went on a wild rampage. Fast forward to medieval times. There were people like Pierre Bougot and Michel Verdun from France who claimed they had an ointment that could turn them into wolves. Then we've got Peter Stuba from Germany, a famous werewolf from back in the day. According to stories, he transformed into a wolf-like creature and gobbled up town people. Hmm. If werewolves were real and lived with us, the world would be a different place. I mean, they aren't like vampires. They would enter our homes without an invitation. But it's not just that. Well, in the regular human form, they'd seem like any other person, but with a few peculiarities. They might have unruly hair or slightly elongated faces. But when the full moon rose, we'd need to get ready for a transformation like no other. Their clothes would be ripped to shreds as their bodies would undergo a wild metamorphosis. Remember Professor Lupin from Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban? They grow, sprout thick fur all over their bodies, and turn into magnificent, snarling, wolf-like creatures with those captivating eyes. Now, how would we keep the peace with these wild and woolly creatures? The law system would have its hands full, and we would need some ideas to keep everyone safe. Governments might implement special laws to deal with werewolf-related incidents. There could be dedicated agencies to monitor supernatural occurrences and ensure the safety of both humans and werewolves. Werewolf registration might be a thing. That is, if werewolves didn't want to stay anonymous. Just like getting a driver's license, werewolves would need to register with the authorities. This way, we'd know who's furry and when. Full moon check-ins could be a necessary procedure, too. During those nights, werewolves might have to check in with a designated place to ensure they're unharmed in a secure location. Plus, just in case someone wouldn't be able to make it to these facilities, the rest of the population might have a nighttime curfew on full moon nights. We could also have friendly neighborhood watches. Werewolves using their super senses for good might be just what we need. Yeah, they'd be like the ultimate neighborhood watch, sniffing out trouble and helping keep the community safe. Volunteers would team up with police to patrol secluded areas. Just bring along some raw meat. Since werewolves are typically considered mythical creatures, it's hard to determine their numbers. Yet, even if they were real, regular humans would still outnumber them. They'd make up a small percentage of the global population. Yes, there would be a werewolf minority. That's why they would keep their true identity a secret to avoid being treated like monsters. They might live among regular humans, pretending to be like everyone else during normal times. Society might become more aware of supernatural beings and mythical creatures in this world with werewolves. 
People might develop a mix of curiosity, fear, and fascination with these creatures, which could lead to both positive and negative consequences. They are already a part of culture and media, but they would have factual representation this time. Since they would be living among us, they would be able to control their transformations and use their abilities carefully. They might become valuable assets in specific fields. Imagine werewolves working in search and rescue teams, or even environmental conservation. This would be a huge deal for scientists and researchers, too. They might be able to study werewolves to understand their unique biology and abilities. Medical research might focus on finding ways to help them control their transformations or harness their powers for the greater good. Maybe one day we could all become werewolves to get the maximum benefit. Experts might also try to find an antidote to cure them. Or we could search for mages and witches because, in this scenario, they could be real too. Here, education is the key. We'd all learn about werewolves and other supernatural beings. I can imagine an online seminar, Let's Howl Together, which would be perfectly normal. Schools would teach both humans and werewolves about each other's cultures and customs, fostering understanding and mutual respect. They'd even have a Werewolf Awareness Week with werewolf-friendly snacks. We could also discuss the ethical side of living together. For werewolves who would prefer living life in their wolf form, we could create sanctuaries where they would roam free under the full moon, away from the city bustle. Think of it as a special lunar community center. On the other side of the coin, we could have moonlit adventure tours for people looking for thrilling experiences, such as entering the woods and witnessing werewolves in action. In this type of world, humans and werewolves would find a way to coexist, hopefully. Cities could host full moon festivals with performances, food, and activities to celebrate werewolves and their moonlit adventures. Also, designated safe zones could be established in urban areas, where werewolves could roam free and let their inner wolves out without any worries. I mean, perhaps you would be a white-collar werewolf. You wouldn't always be able to go to the woods to relax. You could just go to these safe zones. How about celebrations? Maybe we could have an annual Hoey. But these iconic creatures have been portrayed in numerous ways. They don't always seem so friendly. For instance, in Teen Wolf, we get a dose of teenage werewolf antics. Scott, your not-so-average high school student, turns into a wolf on a basketball court. This lovable lycanthrope shows us that being a teen wolf isn't all bad. Well, most of the time. Now, in Grimm, we enter a dark and gritty world of supernatural creatures, including some werewolves. These aren't your fluffy high school wolves, but that series included romance and everyday things too. Then boom! We have the Underworld franchise, which invites us to the epic clash of vampires and werewolves that squeeze humans in between. Here, we witness a fierce rivalry between these two ancient foes, setting the stage for a hair-raising battle royale. These werewolves, known as lichens, are not to be underestimated. They're a force to be reckoned with, a mix of cunning intelligence and primal fury. And in recent times, we've got another type of werewolf with Werewolf by Night. We travel back to the vintage days of comics. This classic story follows Jack Russell, no, not the dog breed, a regular fellow cursed to transform into a werewolf under the full moon. Jack's struggles with his monstrous alter ego are both haunting and heartwarming. Vampires, for instance, are usually depicted as sophisticated people rocking the gothic chic style. On the other hand, werewolves are all about embracing the wild side. They become furry, ferocious, and ready to run wild. Werewolves can form packs, and we can only stop them with items made from silver. Even our loved ones, as werewolves, can hurt us in the full moon if we get in their way, and they might not remember what they did during their furry escapades. Yep, so very glad it's all a myth. Now, if Earth's history were a movie, we humans would only take up the last second of the end credits. Our planet has been around for about 4.6 billion years, 
but our human story began about 300,000 years ago, in Africa. Now our ancestors had some wild adventures in nature. They could have run into creatures so big, they'd make today's elephants look like puppies. The woolly mammoth is a pretty famous animal, sure. His cousin, though, the Colombian mammoth, not so much. This giant used to roam places from Canada all the way down to Mexico. Unlike the furrier woolly mammoths, which hung out in colder places, these animals had shorter hair, resembling huge elephants. They also had incredibly large tusks, like 12 feet worth of spiraling sturdy tusks. And they weren't just for show, they came in handy when facing predators. That includes our ancestors. If you think about sloths these days, you're picturing these adorably slow creatures. They couldn't possibly be in your list of most dangerous animals. Well, their grandparents might have. For starters, we call them ground sloths, and they vary a lot in size. Some were as big as rhinos, and others, like the megatherium, were as colossal as elephants. Imagine seeing a 20-foot-long sloth which doesn't mind chewing on some meat every now and then. At least in theory. Ever heard of Bigfoot? Well, our next animal kind of looks like him, but is a distant cousin to orangutans. Meet Gigantopithecus, the largest primate to ever call our planet its home. Standing tall at 10 feet and weighing more than 600 pounds, these animals were amazing to look at in real life. Unlike Bigfoot, they weren't constantly hiding. In fact, it's believed they were peaceful and gentle creatures. Sadly, they faded away about 100,000 years ago, mainly because their food sources slowly became unavailable. Those lush, fruity forests they called home eventually turned into dry grasslands. Next on our list is the cave hyena. Weighing a chunky 250 pounds and standing 3 feet tall, these beasts were as long as a grown-up lying down. What's even more interesting about these creatures is that they love hanging out in groups. A pack could be as big as 30 of these animals, which meant they could easily take on even the biggest, heaviest mastodons. Our ancient families would have needed to stay alert around these hungry specimens. Sadly, for these hyenas about 20,000 years ago, their numbers started going down. Soon enough, they completely disappeared from the planet. Quick pop quiz. What's called a tiger but isn't really one? It's the saber-toothed tiger. I mean, sure, they belong to the feline family, but they aren't technically tigers. First appearing around 42 million years ago, in July, I think, many of their kind were gone before we even showed up. However, early Americans might have bumped into a couple of specimens from this group. If that really happened, it would have been quite the encounter. Think of the biggest wild lion today or the hefty Siberian tiger. These big cats also had some incredible features hidden in their fur. They were good at sneaking around, hiding, and pouncing on mammoths bigger than themselves. Their bite wasn't that strong, but they could open their jaws wide, like twice as much as a lion. And although their teeth were a bit on the weak side, they had buff forearms to pin down their dinner, giving those big fangs a purpose. Not the kind of kitty you'd want to play with. Dire wolves made their debut about 250,000 years ago. They were like the gray wolves we know today, but a lot stronger. While wolves these days stretch out to about 6 feet and tip the scales at 170 pounds max, dire wolves were about 5 feet and about 150 pounds. Found all over North and South America, they had admirable jaws, biting nearly a third harder than their modern counterparts. Also, their favorite snack was horses. But just like many other majestic beasts of the past, they faded away around 10,000 years ago. Now, names can be deceiving. Take the American lion, for example. It's not really a lion, it's more of a panther's big cousin. The other part of the name is correct, though. They did live in America about 330,000 years ago. This feline was no lap cat either. They were at the top of the wildcat pyramid, weighing a colossal 772 pounds. That's like stacking four grown men on a scale. Even the mighty African lion would look a tad bit shy beside these beasts. With the muscle to take down a bison, you wouldn't want to accidentally interrupt their dinner. They parted ways with this planet around 11,000 years ago, right after the last ice age. 
Now, down in Australia, about 50,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, there lurked a relative of the Komodo dragon, the Megalania. Experts love to have debates on how big it was. Some say it stretched out to 23 feet. Others think it was just about 11 feet long. Either way, they were basically mega-sized Komodo dragons with a dangerous bite. If you think bears are already big and fluffy now, let's introduce the short-faced bear. While this big creature stood on its hind legs, it towered at 14 feet. With long limbs, they could outrun today's bears, hitting speeds up to 40 miles per hour. These ultra bears sadly disappeared around 11,600 years ago. Now imagine a crocodile. Okay, imagine that same crocodile, only supersized, with sporty legs doing its thing in Australia about 1.6 million years ago. Well, say hello to the Quincana. These crocs were extremely large, reaching 23 feet. And no, they weren't lazy river loungers. These creatures really love spending time on land. They evolved to have strong legs for their chases and razor-sharp teeth designed for slicing, not gripping. When did we stop sharing beaches with them? About 40,000 years ago. The name elephant bird might not sound familiar, but try to picture a bird that stood tall as high as a basketball hoop at 10 feet and weighed as much as a small car, 1,500 pounds. Their eggs were equally huge, like 150 chicken eggs bundled up into one. Now, as amazing as these birds sound, there's a lot we still don't know about them. They're hard to study, as most extinct animals are. Still, some recent studies have given us some clues. Scientists have been examining ancient molecules from their fossilized eggshells. It's an awesome piece of evidence, since these birdie shells were thick, preserving precious DNA inside. Plus, there are tons of these eggshell fragments sprinkled all over Madagascar's beaches. Because of these findings, we now know these birds were herbivores and loved eating leaves and seeds. We also know the tiny kiwi bird is its closest living relative. Now, dodos were these amazing birds we also used to share the planet with. They're like distant cousins to agent pigeons. To give you some perspective, imagine a chunky bird weighing about 50 pounds. Similar to chickens, turkeys, and ostriches, dodos were also the types of birds that couldn't fly. Their wings were small, and they had the muscle strength of, well, a wet noodle. Now, you might have heard the word dodo used as a name for creatures that aren't that bright. Don't get confused, though, by this name. These birds were, in fact, intelligent. Scientists were able to figure that out by studying their fossils. It turns out that they were good at smelling stuff, unlike most birds that are all about the visuals. These creatures aren't around for us to study anymore, but that might change. One evolutionary biologist is on a mission to fully understand these amazing ancient birds. On that note, she revealed that the dodo's DNA has been completely sequenced. There are even talks about potentially bringing dodos back to life. They would make a nice addition to the lovely beaches of Mauritius, the place they used to call home many, many years ago. So we're moving to 66 million years ago in the world where dinosaurs lived. What are we doing here? We're just watching these giant reptiles and waiting for one of the most massive disasters on our planet to strike. Right now, a giant asteroid bigger than Mount Everest is flying at a tremendous speed, exceeding the speed of sound 40 times in the direction of our planet from the depths of space. It passes through our atmosphere, heats up, and hits the coastal part of the island of Yucatan, which separates the Gulf of Mexico from the Caribbean Sea. The enormous release of energy destroys all living things in the area, on land and in the ocean. The air over the island is filled with smoke and ash. Yucatan Island has taken the brunt of the blow. The blast wave instantly turns the green territory into a giant, lifeless crater. The asteroid fell at the wrong time. By the moment of the catastrophe, Earth had already been undergoing devastating changes. Continents were separating from one another, and some volcanoes were waking up, pouring lava onto the ground. Dinosaurs had been almost on the edge of extinction, but the asteroid shaped their fate. 
Now, Yucatan looks like a giant funnel of melting rock. There are no more dinosaurs here. But what about those animals that were far from the crash site? The noise from the explosion was so loud that pterodactyls hanging out far from the crater flew up into the sky in fear. A Tyrannosaurus got distracted from its hunting and ran away as far as possible along with Triceratops. But somewhere even further in mainland Mexico, ancient lizards continued to chew grass and run around fields. They did notice a bright flash but didn't mind it. They didn't even hear the sound of the explosion because the sound wave dissipated in the air. No blast wave, no earthquake, and no meteor shower. Dinosaurs continue with their lives. Unfortunately, not for long. Most dinosaurs would have survived if the meteorite had fallen in a field, ocean, or any other place. Perhaps today, you would see them in nature reserves, but the meteorite fell in the most unfavorable place. According to studies, the giant rock had a 1 in 10 chance to destroy dinosaurs, and it took this chance. It wasn't a soft landing. The stone didn't slip on the ground, but hit the rocky terrain like a giant hammer. The catastrophe wasn't limited to a blast wave and a crater. The asteroid fell into large stalks of flammable materials. Simply put, the space rock got into a giant vat of combustible substances. This provoked a drop of millions of tons of soot and ash into the air. The fire quickly spread throughout the island, emitting black smoke into the sky. Dinosaurs living hundreds of miles away from the site are getting nervous. Feelings of anxiety are growing. Their inner instinct of self-preservation signals that disaster is coming. The sky becomes gray and darkens. Black clouds cover the sun and reflect the light. However, these are not just regular clouds, but volcanic ash. The asteroid fell at the most destructive angle. It also hit the coastal part, so the destruction reached the seabed filled with sulfuric acid. And now it's all coming out. Toxic fumes get mixed with incandescent ash, soot, and metals the meteorite contained. A fiery hot cloud emits acidic smoke that is very harmful to health. And this cloud, driven by the winds, grows and stretches all over the continent. It's getting cold on the ground. Plants, grass, and trees are quickly withering. The green valley saturated with life becomes gray and lifeless, which leads to an imbalance in nature. Most dinosaurs can't get fresh grass and leaves. This problem also affects predatory reptiles since the number of herbivorous lizards significantly decreases. Animals start to freeze and starve. They move away to search for some food and find a warm place. But it's too late because a poisonous firestorm is approaching them quickly. Dinosaurs try to hide in burrows and caves. Some lizards are looking at the sky, which is getting darker each second. A tiny sparkle slowly falls from a black, fiery cloud. This is a particle of hot ash. It drops to the ground, touches the dry leaves, and sets them on fire. Millions of such particles fall to the ground. The forest flares up like a match. The smoke from the burning trees rises and becomes part of the expanding ash cloud. The more the fire spreads, the larger the ash cloud becomes. Sulfuric acid vapors mix with molten metal particles and fall to the ground as poisonous droplets. Acid rain corrodes vegetation and poisons the soil. Flying lizards rise into the sky and enter the center of the firestorm. Dinosaurs on the ground are running from the forest towards the water, but it's impossible to escape from the apocalypse. The scale of the disaster is increasing exponentially. While acid rain and firestorms destroy one part of the continent, the coastal side faces another problem. The fall of the meteorite caused a giant tsunami. It hits the shore and floods large areas of land. After the massive explosion, the first wave forms. It could quickly destroy modern-day New York. A series of smaller waves the size of a five-story building sweep across the Atlantic Ocean and the North Pacific Ocean. Giant tsunamis are not so scary for deep-sea dinosaurs, but the poisonous cloud poses a danger to them. 
particles of sulfur and ash cover the sky above the water surface and bring down poisonous rain. Seaweed and phytoplankton don't survive it. Thus, millions of fish face the threat of famine. This causes huge problems for the whole food chain in the ocean. Giant sea lizards can't survive either. The meteorite created a domino effect that put the entire continent under threat of extinction. A few weeks have passed. The ashes have settled and cooled down. The fires are over and the air has become cleaner. The sun is finally peeking through the clouds. But the planet looks different now. Giant lizards don't exist on the planet anymore. Green forests have turned into gray fields. Fortunately, not for long. The seeds of plants and trees have survived the apocalypse and are now blooming with renewed vigor. Nature is filled with colors again. Little creatures similar to rats have been hiding in the ground and have also survived. And now they finally get out to continue spreading life. It wasn't firestorms, tsunamis, fires and lack of sunlight that destroyed the dinosaurs. The primary damage to the world at that moment was the disruption of the food chain. All big herbivorous dinosaurs and giant toothy monsters lost their food sources. Small animals and some flying dinosaurs survived to further evolve into modern birds and mammals. Large animals the size of a rhinoceros appeared 15 million years after the disaster. Tens of millions of years passed since that moment, and then humanity appeared. Thanks to modern technology, we've discovered the reasons for the destruction of dinosaurs. We don't know every detail, but we have a common picture of those events. And the scariest thing is that if the same asteroid fell again into some explosive terrain, we wouldn't be able to do anything about it, and our remarkable technologies wouldn't help much. Yes, we might disperse ash clouds and extinguish some fires, but it would be insignificant. Floods, fires, and acid rain would make life in big cities unbearable. The only thing that would help us survive could be underground bunkers and other reliable shelters. But how to survive the famine that would come after the destruction of vegetation and crops? We are developing and improving technologies that can protect us from asteroids, like lasers or space rockets with explosives. But even if we destroy one big rock, it might tear into a million pieces. Some will burn up in the atmosphere, and some will fall on the planet in the form of a meteor shower. Anyway, we'll face huge natural disasters. Therefore, all we can do now is hope that no rock from space will come to us. I'm about to tell you the story of a man who voluntarily decided to share a room with snakes for 72 hours. It wasn't just for the thrill, rest assured. He did this to prove that snakes are not just nightmare fuel. He believed that most of them are simply toothy introverts. It's worth mentioning, the fear of snakes comes in at the top 10 world of phobias. Not surprising, considering some of these nope ropes can send you to the doctor in no time. Regardless of whether it's a primal defense mechanism or just a deep dislike for legit critters, let's be real. Snakes aren't exactly on our most wanted pet list. Either way, this particular gentleman from India decided to moonwalk over this general fear and challenge it head on. Make room for the hero of our thrilling story, who at the time was a 28-year-old desk jockey at a hotel in Pune, India. The year? 1986. During his work hours, he'd apparently had to struggle with snakes that flocked in the hotel for their own vacations. As fate would have it, the task of dealing with these unexpected guests fell on him. When recalling those days, he remembered feeling sorry about the snakes, which he called gorgeous beings. Yikes, why? Because he said most of these reptiles were harmless. So he started transporting them to some nearby hills. One time, he had to drive all the way to an institute in Bombay to deliver a snake, only to find out that his unlikely passenger was quite the dangerous type. Did he find this experience terrifying? Absolutely not. It only fed his desire to study and understand these creatures even more. Sure, he claimed to have performed an amazing 25,000 snake extractions, but admitted to receiving only about 6,000 bites. 
a number that makes you think twice about his idea of acceptable. Now here's the really interesting part. This man, upon hearing about a courageous South African individual who pulled a 50-hour chill session with 24 snakes, felt the urge to one-up him. He aimed to bring the world record trophy to his own country. So he built a glass cage with a comfy chair for the ultimate snake-cation. His choice of roomies for the next 72 hours was a jaw-dropping collection of over 70 snakes featuring cobras, vipers, banded krites, and a bunch of common snakes too. Just a heads up, about 60 of them were quite capable of causing him harm. Despite these hair-raising odds, our valiant hero stuck it out in his glassy chamber for three whole days. Under the watchful eye of a Guinness World Record official, he outshone the initial record holder and, in his mind, drove his point home. Snakes are Zen masters unless disturbed. He demonstrated this by gently shuffling the snakes around his personal space without a single nibble in retaliation. Incredibly, this dangerous stunt only made him even more besotted with these animals. So, obviously, he didn't just stop there. The Snake Whisperer followed through with his ambitions and opened the Indian Herpetological Society. He also created a serpent sanctuary. He continued his snake protection work through awareness campaigns, even penning books on Indian snakes to spread his newfound knowledge. Our hero's commitment to these slithery pals was so important that a newly discovered snake was chosen to bear his name as a forever token of gratitude. Isn't it amazing how some people can reshape our understanding of certain animals? Take Dr. Jane Goodall too. To tell her story, we have to travel back to the year 1960. Back then, she was just a 26-year-old chilling out in the wild and windy expanses of Tanzania's Gambe Stream National Park. Her mission? To cozy up with a group of chimpanzees. Little did she know that she was on the brink of becoming a renowned legend before she'd even see her 27th birthday. In her childhood, her days were filled with a supersized serving of animal love and an irresistible curiosity about Africa. During her 20s, she received a surprise invitation from an old playground pal who took her on an African adventure in Kenya. Fellow researchers and animal enthusiasts soon figured out she had a zen-like patience, perfect for hanging out with chimps and digging into the roots of human behavior. And so, our heroine found herself playing peekaboo with wild chimps in Gambe, with her dear mother as her loyal sidekick. Armed with nothing more than a pen, a pair of binoculars, a notebook, and a whistle, Jane dove headfirst into a world of chimp shenanigans. Her tactics were a bit unusual for the time. She even named the chimps she observed, choosing this over simply numbering them. What started as a quick six-month safari turned into a wildly epic 26-year saga of hanging out with some of our closest living primate cousins. Throughout her work, Jane found groundbreaking insights from the artistry of chimp nest construction to their eating preferences. She rewrote the chimp playbook. One of her most important discoveries about chimpanzees includes the fact that these highly intelligent primates use tools in their day-to-day -day lives. They use stones, for instance, to crack nuts wide open so they can easily enjoy them. She also figured out that contrary to what was believed at the time, chimps weren't vegetarian. Jane also observed that chimps are vibrant creatures that tend to be more outgoing compared to other primates, like gorillas or orangutans. They love company and thrive in relaxed groups, sometimes called communities. Most chimps gather around a grown male specimen within a certain area. The sizes of these chimp families are similar to those of humans, some ranging from just 20 members to even more than 100. Other scholars were less interested in present-day animals, but their work is equally as impressive. Mm -hmm. Let's journey back to the late 18th century to meet Mary Annan, the rock star of the fossil world. She came from a lovely seaside town in Dorset, England. This is the place where she chalked up the leaderboard of fossil discoveries, way before the movies made dinosaurs cool again. Mary was not born with a silver spoon in her mouth, her family didn't really have much money. 
but that didn't stop her from pursuing her dream. Her father, Richard, was a hobbyist fossil aficionado who crafted furniture on the side to pay the bills. Young Mary was his sidekick, joining him in his treasure hunts on the beach. Their finds were given special places in his shop. Mary didn't spend much time behind the school desks either, but don't let that trick you. The girl had the brains of a university professor. She taught herself to read and even got herself a degree in geology and anatomy. Soon enough, Mary became the family's resident fossil provider to pay off debts. Thankfully, her hometown was rich in ammonites. These creatures were like the grandparents of the sea world, super ancient with stylish variety, sporting spirally shelly overcoats. At some point during their existence, these creatures got stuck in the dirt. As time went by, their bodies left a shell-shaped stamp on the ocean floor. This nifty natural bookmark eventually got a mineral-filled makeover, becoming a copycat of our snazzy ammonite, but in stone form. In 1811, Mary's brother stumbled upon a weird-looking fossil skull. Mary then took up the challenge of excavating the 17-foot-long skeleton, making the town buzz with the rumor of a monster discovery. Scientists back then initially thought it was a crocodile that got lost and ended up in Dorset. Mary's mysterious find was examined, argued over, and finally determined to be Ichthyosaurus, or fish lizard. We now know it was actually a marine reptile that swam around some 200 million years ago. Fast forward to 1823, when Mary pulled another rabbit out of her hat, the first complete skeleton of a plesiosaurus. So extraordinary was this discovery that some skeptics labeled it as a hoax. A special committee was assembled without inviting Mary. How rude. After a lot of chin scratching, the skeptics had to swallow their words. Mary wasn't done though. In 1828, she unveiled the skeleton of a long-tailed creature with wings, creating a sensation from London to Paris. This was the first pterodactyl ever found outside Germany. For more than 170 million years, they dominated our planet. From small creatures that were only a few feet long to some of the biggest animals to have ever roamed the land. Let's admit it, the age of dinosaurs gave us some pretty scary predators like T-Rex, Spinosaurus, the Velociraptor, Gigantosaurus, and so many others that made the rest of the animals shiver in fear. But everyone talks about dinosaurs all the time, so it seems like no other scary beasts ruled the animal kingdom besides them. But check out these reptiles. They dominated the prehistoric world for more than 120 million years, way before dinosaurs. But even before them, nature had to create the first true reptile. There was a swampy, wet era when many new groups of plants grew into great forests in tropical deltas and swamps. Trees were not like those we see today. They were mostly horsetails, club mosses, and the first seed-bearing plants called gymnosperms. It was during this time that the first peat bogs formed too. The most common creatures on land were prehistoric amphibians, which evolved from fish that were basically sick of being in the water all the time. So they decided to take a walk to see what was happening on dry land. Those early amphibians had a problem though. They depended on water to stay well hydrated and lay their eggs, so they couldn't go too far from lakes, rivers, and oceans. At least not until a special creature called Hylonymus evolved. With its four legs and scaly skin, we're looking at our best candidate for the first true reptile. These features help the animal move away from the water and explore dry land. As plants were intensely growing back then, they produced more and more oxygen, which probably helped these complex animals, such as our buddy Hylonymus here, develop. Let's rewind the story a little bit. 300 million years ago, Earth was hotter and drier, which was not that good for amphibians, but was great news for small reptiles like Hylonymus. These reptiles were able to regulate their body temperature and lay eggs on land, so they didn't need to stay close to water. That's when they started evolving into different groups. 
One was called pelicosaurs, and they lived in different ways. Some ate plants, while others preferred meat. You might recognize the most famous one from their group, with a big sail on its back. People often mistake this creature for a dinosaur. Over time, some pelicosaurs evolved into the so-called mammal-like reptiles we called therapsids. Therapsids had stronger jaws and sharper teeth, and some could stand upright on their legs, unlike their ancestors that moved more like lizards. Take Gorgonopsians, one of the top predators of their time that even dinosaurs wouldn't have liked to face. In a way, they were similar to mammals because they were probably endothermic, which means their body had a constant internal temperature. They had long legs good for running and hunting. They mostly lived in southern Africa, but their fossils were spread across Europe and China too. Oh, the joys of times when continents were joined together. Top predators had no limits back then. Gorgonopsians went after different animals, especially those armored ones related to turtles. That's the type of chase I wish I had the chance to see. Some Gorgonopsians had really big skulls, almost 1.6 feet long. Scientists think some of them may have hunted in groups, but we're not sure about that. One specific Gorgonopsian was about 3.2 feet long and had a skull that looked like a wolf's face. It had long, sharp teeth in both the lower and upper jaw, similar to the saber-toothed cats. You may have heard about these from the Ice Age. Such teeth were good protection in such messy, insecure times. And we need to mention the Permian extinction. About 250 million years ago, 90% of all species, including animals in the seas and on land, as well as most of the trees, disappeared from the face of the Earth. Why did this happen? Scientists are still not sure. One theory says it may have been a massive asteroid impact, while another theory claims the spread of toxic levels of carbon dioxide in the ocean erased marine life. There's also some evidence of massive volcanic eruptions around the same time as the extinction. These eruptions could have released gases into the atmosphere, causing acid rain and making our home planet cooler. And all these things might have affected life in the ocean and reduced diversity in animal and plant kingdoms in general. Whatever the reason for the worst mass extinction in the history of our planet was, the Rapsids managed to go through all these troubles and survive. Not only that, they spread out and evolved into many different groups. Some of them even got cool features that made them more similar to mammals. Fossils show some reptiles had fur and maybe even warm-blooded metabolisms. They may have had wet black noses, like dogs, but it would be tricky to take this one for a walk. One of them might have given birth to live young, which is a characteristic of mammals rather than reptiles. Unfortunately, the rhapsids eventually went extinct and ended up being replaced by archosaurs, which were finally the ancestors of dinosaurs. But not all of them disappeared. Some survived alongside dinosaurs for millions of years. That probably wasn't an easy task. They continued to evolve and eventually became the first prehistoric mammals. But moving back to the pre-dinosaur era. Wait, what's that buzzing sound? Oh wow, the biggest insect ever! Yup, it's Meganora, a giant dragonfly that lived about 300 million years ago. Its wingspan could be more than 28 inches. They were predators and would mostly go after other insects, but I'm not sure I'd feel safe if they were flying around these days. Imagine getting back from a camping trip and instead of scary stories about terrifying beasts wandering in the woods, you only have one where an insect pushed you down and stole your stuff. And it's really weird these insects could grow so big during the period when they lived. One idea says it's due to higher oxygen levels in the air at that time. A lot of carbon ended up trapped in plants, so the oxygen levels were higher. Insects breathe in a different way than most animals, 
They have these special tubes called trachea that deliver oxygen directly to their body tissues. But this system is not very efficient for bigger insects. Oxygen moves slowly through the trachea, so the tissues in the middle of big insects wouldn't get enough oxygen to survive in today's world, where there is less oxygen. And for that, I'm very, very happy. And what about Arthropleura? a giant millipede that lived more than 300 million years ago. It was one of the biggest invertebrates ever discovered that could grow up to 8.5 feet, similar to a small car. Now that's a ride I wouldn't like to take. And once again, lots of oxygen probably gave a chance to these creatures to grow up to be the biggest of their kind. Arthropleura weighed around 110 pounds which would be similar to a big dog. And it used to roam the beaches of ancient England. Well, okay, I'm fine. I'll find a pool somewhere. And their fossils showed us where they lived. Many used to think they preferred coal swamps, but newer research tells us they mostly lived in open woodlands. They could get a lot of food there, like seeds, nuts, and of course, some other small innocent animals. These creatures existed for about 45 million years and went extinct more than 250 million years ago. No one knows for sure why they disappeared, but some scientists believe they may have been competing with reptiles that eventually replaced them. And this slowly led to the rise of our beloved dinosaurs. Sing with me. Under the sea, darling, it's better. On where it's drier, take it from me. Okay, okay, I know these are not the correct lyrics to this famous Disney song, but hear me out. The deep sea is not all about singing mermaids and dancing crabs. It's actually filled with monster-like creatures that'll give you nightmares. So, if you're ready to meet them, grab your scuba gear and let's dive into the deep, mysterious waters to discover their fascinating and scary world. With its menacing appearance, one could call this fishy the vampire of the sea. While named for their disproportionately large, razor-sharp fangs protruding from their mouth, fang tooths are actually quite small and harmless to humans. These choppers are actually more for catching prey than causing trouble, so there's no need to panic if you see one. And you'll be even more relieved to know that it's kind of unlikely for you to come across a fang tooth since they are among the deepest living fish. A regular day in the life of a fang tooth looks like this. By day, they prefer to remain in the gloomy depths. Me too, fishies, me too. It's only towards the evening that they migrate toward the surface to have a feast under starlight. Ah, how romantic! And by daybreak, they return to the deep. What a chill schedule, am I right? So, as you can tell from their daily routine, fang tooths are among the more active deep sea fishes. And by that I mean they seek out their food rather than just sitting and waiting. And thanks to their oversized teeth and mouth, hey, I can relate, they're able to attack prey that are even larger than themselves, which is very important in the very large, food-poor deep sea. Fitting to their environment, common fang tooths are dark-colored, either solid brown or black. And unlike most deep-sea fishes, they do not have light-producing organs or cells to communicate with each other or to attract their prey. Instead, they rely heavily on their sense of smell, in addition to making use of even the slightest bit of sunlight that makes it down to the depths. This light doesn't help them to see in any way, but it may be enough for potential prey to cast a shadow as they pass overhead, which lets fang tooths know they're around. Now here's one hilarious fun fact before we move on to the next creature. Fangtooths can never close their mouths because of their huge mouths and long teeth. But you know what? I would bet maybe 500 bucks that my orthodontist would claim he could fix that too. Our next horrific deep sea animal is as real as a kraken can get. Giant squid, which actually did inspire the legends of the kraken, live up to their name. The largest one ever recorded by scientists was almost 59 feet long. It also probably weighed nearly a ton. You would think such a massive animal wouldn't be hard to miss. But since giant squid live deep underwater, they are difficult to come by. Giant squid, along with their cousin, the colossal squid, yep, they are different, have the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They're somewhere around 10 inches in diameter. 
In other words, they are around the size of dinner plates. Peekaboo! Having such large eyes allows them to detect objects in the lightless depths of the ocean, where most other animals would see nothing. Not a zippo. Giant squids have eight arms and two long feeding tentacles that help them seize their prey. These tentacles are tipped with hundreds of powerful sharp teeth and are often double the length of their body. This helps them to snatch prey up to 33 feet away. Hey there, come a little closer. Most of what we know about giant squids come from those that floated to the surface and were found by fishermen. After years of research, it was only in 2012 that a group of scientists were able to successfully film a giant squid in its natural habitat for the first time. Yet again, the giant squid continues to remain largely a mystery due to their inhospitable deep-sea habitat. And maybe they're shy. Speaking of squids, this species is basically the space creature of the ocean. So, it's only been about 20 years since the big fin squid family was officially described by scientists. And there are still plenty of facts about them that are yet to be discovered. However, the big fin squid sightings as deep as 20,000 feet below the surface suggest that they can live deeper than any other known squid. You know what? Let's scratch the word space creature and call them the disco dancers of the deep sea to make things a little less scary. Because of their long slender arms, adorned with extravagant rib-like fins, kind of make them look like they're ready to hit the dance floor. Anyway, these boogie arms and tentacles are estimated to max out at just under 30 feet. Aside from the estimations, though, the largest known big fin squid was actually 21 feet long, with 20 feet of that being its arms and tentacles. How exactly a big fin squid uses them is still unknown. But scientists think they like to use them to trap prey that bump into them as they hang down in the water below their body or drag along the seafloor. There were only around a dozen confirmed big fin squid sightings worldwide, so you can just relax. Because the chances of you getting hugged by a big fin squid are close to impossible. But I can't guarantee anything regarding your nightmares. <laughs> now, these are not one of your regular Jaws sharks. Let's start with the most strange fact about a frilled shark. It's considered a living fossil because of its primitive anatomic traits. That actually makes more sense once you learn that this species has been around for 80-some million years. So I have both good news and bad news. Frilled sharks live in the open ocean and spend much of their time in deep, dark waters far below the surface. However, they do feed at the surface of the ocean at night. When hunting food, they move like an eel, bending and lunging to capture their prey. And they can actually swallow it as whole, even if it is larger than their own size. This is all thanks to their long and flexible jaws, which are equipped with 300 recurved needle-like teeth. Okay, I am somewhat freaked out now. Unlike the rest of the deep-sea creatures I've talked about, frilled sharks might sometimes accidentally get caught in nets. So if fishing is your thing, <laughs> beware. This telescope won't help you see the stars and the planets. With its protruding eyes and elongated body, this little swimmer looks like it's wearing a pair of underwater binoculars, hence the name the telescope fish. Found in cold, deep, tropical to subtropical waters worldwide, they're known to be the species that undergoes one of the most drastic transformations in fishes. When the first larva was described in 1954, it was believed to be a new species rather than the larva of a telescope fish that were known to science since 1901. Despite the fact that they are only around 6 to 8 inches long, they're able to latch onto snacks that are bigger than their own size. That is thanks to their massive and highly stretching jaws, making up most of the size of their head. These large prey are then folded in half to fit in their expandable stomach. In 1925, scientists found a 5.5 inch long fish inside the stomach of a 3 inch long telescope fish, which they described as neatly folded. Despite all this, their cylindrical tube shaped eyes are still the most fascinating and bizarre features of telescope fishes. Their specific shape increases light collection to help them detect their prey's weak bioluminescence even from a distance. But although their eyes are good for seeing things in the twilight, they're especially great at seeing silhouettes from below, 
that's why they orient themselves vertically in the water. Now I have to admit, they look kind of cute if you ask me. Sort of like uglier versions of minions. Yeah, right? Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles. And they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the jumping cholla, or teddy bear cholla. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping choya and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So, yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators but its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The Gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still. There's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. 
The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Salpigid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. Ah, the desert welcomes you with challenging conditions of abandoned environments and extreme temperatures. Hey, some of us would prefer dessert, chocolate over sand and rocks. Oh well, just like cactuses and camels, buildings have had to adapt to these conditions. Here are some examples of astonishing structures in deserts. These structures are called earthships. They're located in a New Mexico desert town. A large community of like-minded people lives in them. What's even more interesting is that the location of these buildings is registered as dumpsters. Maybe it's because all these structures are made out of old tires, bottles, and cans. Earthships operate using green building principles. About 40% of a typical earthship is built with natural or recycled materials. Imagine the walls made up of hundreds of used tires packed with dirt. Then there are layers of floor-to-ceiling passive solar windows. They gather the sunlight during winter and reflect it in the summer to keep the structures at a reasonable room temperature. You can see plants in corridors and glass bottles or aluminum cans stuffed inside walls. Certainly a distinct house in many ways. 
Mike Reynolds is an architect who noticed the alarming waste and consumption levels in the 1970s. He designed a fully sustainable home out of cans back then. Almost 40 years later, he becomes the one who brings together all the other earth shippers. Reynolds drove a Mercedes, but it ran off of the vegetable oil he picked up at fast food restaurants in town. A standard two-bedroom, two-bathroom earth ship costs about $250,000 in this town. Yet there are earth ships, like Dobson House, that can cost as much as $1.5 million. If you do it yourself, you know, with family and friends, you can eliminate the cost of labor, and it becomes relatively less expensive. Let's assume you're really going to build one. Where can it be? Well, anywhere. Earth ships currently fit in the cold, dry air of Canada, as well as the hot and humid climate of Haiti. This is the Mirage Mirror House. It's an installation set in the Southern California desert. Mirage opened in 2017 as part of a contemporary art exhibition. It's composed of mirrors. This minimalistic structure blends with the environment around it. The doors, windows, and openings have been removed to create an amazing experience. What you have in the landscape is reflected back to you. How's it made? With mirrored surfaces. At night, the distant lights refract from the mirrors. In the daytime, the sky is transformed into banks of clouds. There's no fixed scenery in this house. How about seeing a futuristic structure in the deep desert? Architect designed a concept home that pairs perfectly with Elon Musk's Cybertruck. The house has a post-apocalyptic theme. I mean, when I say post-apocalyptic, it's because I can't say it. Anyway, the house is designed to survive in a disaster scenario. The cyber house has steel gates, the windows are armored, and the exterior walls are made out of super strong material. Modern house is controlled by an autonomous geothermal heat pump. To put it in less sci-fi terms, you can keep the internal temperature steady. This sleek house has an entrance that can fit the Cybertruck. After all, it's inspired by it in the first place. Plus, the Cybertruck can be lifted to the second floor to be more secure. This is King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Saudi Arabia. Basically, it's a laboratory in a desert. It was designed to demand minimum energy. The architecture has patterns on the walls and ceilings, giving reference to the local tradition of geometric form. The next stop is Swartberg House in South Africa. This one is located near the Swartberg Mountains, but don't get too excited. It's on the edge of the Great Karoo Desert. It's a four-bedroom apartment. It has a special temperature regulating system. The system works like a shield from the heat in the summer and as a sun trap in the winter. You're looking at the Grand Mosque of Jene in Mali. This mosque is 52 feet tall. This is impressive because it's made of only sticks and a special mix of mud and other natural elements found in the desert. Petra is an ancient city hidden in the Jordan Desert. The structures are carved directly into red, white, and pink-colored sandstone cliff faces. It's located among the canyons and mountains near the desert. The place was a trade center many, many years ago. You might already see pictures of the impressive facade of the treasury. This structure still holds many mysteries in it. For starters, scientists can't explain how the Nabataeans managed to create such a structure thousands of years ago. Did you know that there's another mysterious place in the middle of the desert that has a similar structure to Petra? Medayan Saleh was like a second capital of the Nabataean kingdom. Yet another secret they left for us to decipher. It has over 100 decorated tombs and more than a thousand non-monumental graves. Plus, inscriptions and cave drawings are also here, again surrounded by sandstone. This wooden shack was a post office once. The structure is in the Tengar Desert of Mongolia. It's surrounded by… Hmm, nothing. Sand is the only thing that accompanies the lonely structure. The building is only 23 square inches. As you can guess, it didn't get too many visitors. It was abandoned for over 35 years. Its fate changed one day when a woman discovered the building. Mrs. Zhang and her friend came up with an idea. They were going to reach businesses and people who wanted to send letters and postcards from the world's loneliest post office without actually visiting the place. It worked. The post office rarely gets visitors in place, but it's busy online. Over 20,000 letters and postcards were sent from the desert post office in December 2021 alone. The place is about 6 miles off the nearest road. A post truck picks the letters up and hits the road for delivery. Eventually, they are shipped all over the world. A second destination in Saudi Arabia 
is King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture. The building has an interesting design. It took nearly a decade to build this complex structure. It's a 321-foot-tall tower which stands out with its look. Stone Matters Pavilion is a stone structure in Palestine. The structure spans a surface area of 93 square inches. It has been built entirely out of 300 interlocking stones that mutually support each other. The concave roofs, and yes, they look like giant bowls, are designed that way to collect rainwater. The structure is in Iran. Interestingly, in Iran, the evaporation rate is three times faster than the world average, so this bowl-like design comes in very handy. It captures the water in a way that the water can form a single mass as a whole before it evaporates. The outer shell of the roof system collects rainwater, but it also works as an additional shading. It makes air move freely, designed like a cooling mechanism for both roofs. Eco Lodge in Egypt is the next stop. The project is built in a place that overlooks the desert and is constructed using locally available materials like sun-fired bricks and palm wood. The building is an example of traditional architecture. There's a water basin that lets in the air to keep the interior cool. A worthy mention is the CID Interpretation Center in Chile. Chile's Atacama Desert is among the top tourist destinations in the country. To help the tourists, architects designed a visitor center as part of the infrastructure for the wind farm. Here, the cold winter months don't freeze people because the large windows make the most of solar heating. What's even more interesting is that the building is designed to go completely dark at night. Imagine you somehow bumped into the building by accident. Black Desert House is a building respecting the stars. At night, this house goes completely dark. It dissolves into the night, so the stars can appear more prominent. Now, any mysterious desert buildings you know that aren't on this list? Let us know in the comments. Mirror check. You've got your beige parka on, your chisel is packed, and your overnight plane ride to Saudi Arabia is booked. You know what this means, right? Unfortunately, you weren't cast in the remake of Dune. It just means that you're ready to go explore the world's largest desert areas in the hopes of uncovering prehistoric secrets about our ancestors. Let's get one thing straight. If you ever thought that deserts were empty spaces, think again. They might be filled with sand as far as the eye can see, but they also hold a lot of history. You know, because before humans settled down in cities and towns, we were nomadic people, and we traveled all around the globe looking for food, water, and shelter. So we had to come up with some interesting stuff to survive. Like this thing that was found in the desert of Saudi Arabia. Do you have any idea what this could have been? Over many years, scientists have discussed the origins and use of huge structures such as these ones. It seems our Neolithic ancestors were way smarter than we gave them credit for. They didn't spend all their hours around the fire carving weapons out of stone. No, they were also practicing their architectural skills. These huge stone structures are called desert kites. Because if you look at them from a distance, well, they sort of look like kites. Archaeologists have arrived at the consensus that these kites were used to lure animals in. This way, it would make it easier for our ancestors to guarantee their week's food. But that's not all. Take a look at these monolithic structures right here. They show us that our ancestors probably drew on rocks, the blueprint of what they were going to build on the ground. Just like modern-day architects, desert kites could be miles long, so they drew out a plan before actually building them. The most surprising feature of all is that these kites were built even before things such as Stonehenge. We're talking around 7,000 to 9,000 years ago. Over the last decade, scientists have been able to identify over 6,000 desert kites spread across the Middle East and West and Central Asia. If you don't think this huge, try building something this large, without the help of any drones. It looks like a pretty difficult feat to me. And apparently, Saudi Arabia's desert is filled with more amazing things. Scientists have found mysterious stone structures that are older than the pyramids of Giza in Egypt. So of course, you can't wait to go check that out. Can we all agree that carrying around heavy rocks to build a pyramid without the help of modern technology sounds absurd? I mean, how on earth did they do it? Now imagine turning back the clock about 2,000 years into the past and finding humans that built similar gigantic structures in isolated areas. Take a look at these so-called mustadles. They are rectangular structures built from piled up stones, found over 77,000 square miles. 
Some archaeologists believe that these monuments were used for ritualistic purposes, maybe processions of some kind, where people would walk from one end of the plateau to the other. I'd be down for that. Now let's move on to another deserted area. We're entering the world-famous Sahara Desert landscape. Isn't it beautiful? Here you're about to unravel an ancient mystery, something that took years for researchers to solve. Fun fact, the Sahara Desert is the world's largest hot desert. It spans over 3 million square miles, which would be like putting a thousand times the country of Hawaii next to each other. We say it's the largest hot desert because the world's largest desert area is Antarctica. But we all know temperatures over there are freezing, not the typical image of when we think of a desert. Deep into the desert, near the Algerian town of Fogaret at Zua, something strange was found. For decades, these tiny dots appeared on images of Google Earth, but nobody could explain what they were. Some scientists were sure that these circles are the result of oil activity in the region. Others guessed that these were ancient fogaras or ancient water wells. There are dozens of them, stretching for miles and miles in a straight line. The strange thing is that they are always far away from any town, road, or human activity in general. So what was or is their purpose? If you had to take a guess, what would you say? Remember we talked about how our ancestors had to be creative in order to survive in the desert? Let's try to walk in their shoes for a minute. Imagine you're a nomadic hunter-gatherer living in a desert area. You spend your days basking in the hot sun, trying to count all the grains of sand around you. But you also need to eat and drink water. But how on earth do you get water in a desert? Sure, you can hope to keep running into Oasis every week or so, but that seems a bit risky, doesn't it? That's why North African people invented the so-called Fogaras. The Fogaras are a 2,500-year-old irrigation system. Locals would dig deep wells in elevated areas, wells deep enough to tap into underground water. Then, they would dig parallel shafts at regular distances. This way, the water would flow from the main well down into all the shafts and irrigate entire areas. Travelers could stop by the shafts and quench their thirst. They could also raise livestock and tend to crops. Pretty clever, huh? As much as these holes did look like Fogaras, a little bit of research would show you that they're not. You see, these shafts were built in a line, and not in a circular shape like the ones we're looking at now. So maybe it has something to do with the second option? Maybe these desert holes were related to oil activity in the region? Let's have a look at the holes up close and personal. From Google Earth, they don't seem that big, but in real life, they are huge craters. The tip to uncovering what they are is hidden beneath the sand. If you were one of the researchers originally uncovering the truth behind this mystery, you would have found something unique hidden in the sand. Old dynamites and vintage sardine cans. Putting the pieces of the puzzle together, scientists found that these sardine cans were a model from the 1950s and 1960s. It seems that entire teams from that decade would camp out while they surveyed the area for oil. And what about the dynamites? These were used for seismic surveying. This is an old technique, used to identify if there is oil and gas beneath the Earth's surface. Still in North Africa, you find out about another desert mystery worth exploring. Near the city of Tiaret, southwest of Algeria's capital, one runs into 13 peculiar monuments. These structures are also called Jedars, and yes, I am aware of how much that may sound like a Star Wars reference. They are pyramid-like in their shapes, and as far as scientists know, they were used as final resting places for the people who lived in the region. Can you guess who these were? Most likely the Berber nomads. And since we're talking about ancient stuff, they were probably built between the 4th and 7th centuries CE. Once scientists began to explore the insides of these monuments, they found they were pretty big inside. They found large underground vaults, chambers, and labyrinth-like corridors that gave way to over 20 compartments. It could take you up to two hours to walk around in them, and apparently our ancestors also used its walls to depict images of animals and hunting scenes. There's no definite proof of what these jadars were used for, though. This is so neat, huh? I'm sure that our world's desert is filled with many more mysterious things